It's good. I can hear myself too. So, got it. Okay. Howdy. Howdy. All right. That's it. Uh, so, my name is Mark Clayton. I'm the director of the CRS Center here at Texas A&M. Uh, so, um, and I'm a design prof for some of you, uh, or maybe some of you in the future too. So, um, we're really excited to put on this symposium, mini symposium on uh, uh, advanced wood products, design for advanced wood products. So, the point of view is from designers, because y'all are mostly designers. Uh, but these new products for uh, uh, made out of wood, uh, out of lumber, that are becoming very popular in the United States. Some of them have been around a long time, things like glue lambs and, and other mass timber construction. But uh, in particular, CLT, cross laminated timber, so where you're building entire walls out of, uh, out of timber elements. And uh, I'm not going to tell you all about it because we've got three wonderful guests here to tell you about it. Um, so, uh, so those guests, and I'll run through their names uh, now, but I'll introduce each of them as they come up to speech. So there's Aaron Stottlemyre of the Texas Forestry Service, right? And there's um, Mark Bartlett from, uh, from Woodworks, which is a, uh, a group, an industry group that's promoting uh, this and other wood products. Uh, and Professor Tate, who you may know, uh, one of our own faculty members who's been working uh, with Mass Timber and building things with Mass Timber uh, with students uh, in the past year and, and more. So, um, so uh, that's kind of the overview of this. So three, uh, three great present presentations. We'll have a panel afterwards. Uh, I do want to introduce one more person. Brent Cobb is joining us. He's a, you know, he represents a manufacturer of Mass Timber and CLT products uh, here in, in Texas. So, um, so it's great to have these people here. Uh, and we're gonna start off with uh, Aaron Stottlemyre uh, and he'll talk about the importance of wood in sustainable architecture and construction. Uh, Aaron is a uh, forest resource analyst with Texas A&M Forest Service, a position he has held since June, 2017. His major duties include analyzing forest inventory and analysis data, conducting studies of statewide timber supply, harvest and utilization, uh, and economic development. Uh, prior to joining TFS, he was an assistant professor of forestry and program leader uh, uh, at Penn State University. Um, you know, he completed his doctorate and master's degrees in forest resources at Clemson University, bachelor's and associate degrees at Penn State. He's held several positions um, with state and federal uh, natural resource agencies. He's a Texas accredited forester, currently serves on the Texas Forestry Association Board of Directors, past chair of the Texas Society of American Foresters. So give us a minute, and we'll transfer the microphone and then he's got the floor. Cut it. Right. How's that? Good. Sound good? Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is great to be with you today. Uh, I want to uh, I want to thank Mark Clayton uh, for the opportunity to be here with you today and uh, the School of Architecture for their support. Of, of this kind of work. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it feels like I'm, I find myself in Lankford uh, uh, every, every couple of months, which is, which is great. And uh, it's, it's great to see the room full of, of students. Um, I'll talk, talk more about that. So welcome students, uh, welcome faculty, and uh, hopefully we can uh, get you enthusiastic about, about Mass Timber because I think it represents just an extraordinary possibility for, for all of you as you, as you go forward 
uh, and, and given the opportunities that exist, uh, it's, it's great that you've got faculty that are interested in incorporating uh, this sort of thing into your curriculum. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, as was mentioned before, I, I am with the Texas A&M for a service. Um, by the way, we are a, a state agency. We're in the A&M system. So we're all kind of part of the same team, uh, if, if, if you will. Uh, our agency headquarters are uh, here in College Station. We're about six miles to, to the south, uh, down Highway 6. So we are headquartered here in, in College Station, but we've got uh, offices all, all over the state. So uh, I want to start uh, with a, a question to, to all of us, for, for all of us to think about. And, and the question is this, uh, what is wood? And, and the reason I ask this is, is to kind of give you some insight into uh, one of the reasons why I became a forester um, not too many years ago, um, but it's, it's kind of a, a manifestation, a, a question that's a manifestation out, out of my kind of uh, fascination with trees. So my question to you is, what, what is wood? So this is the participation part of the uh, of the program. The structural cellulose. Okay, well it's not structural until we use it to to, to build with. But okay, I, okay, but but what is it? Oh, I'm sorry. The the body of the tree, but. It, it, it is for, for water transport, but, but, but what is it? Like what's in there? Lignin, well, that's, that's kind of the glue. We heard cellulose and glue, or, or, and lignin. So lignin is kind of the glue that, that binds the, the cellulose molecules together. But what are those things made out of? No, you, no, you, you don't count. Okay, so now you're, you're on the right track. So I'm wanting you to think kind of anatomically, all right? So carbon is one of the elements that comprises wood. What are the others? Well, sh sugars, yes, but what atoms comprise the sugars? Carbon is one of them. I'm sorry? Well, glucose is, is a sugar. Okay, so what's in water? Okay, so hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, all right, so we, we, we got them all. So carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This wasn't supposed to take this long. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay, now, where do those atoms come from? Water is one of the answers. Where does the carbon come from? The atmosphere as what? In what form? Carbon dioxide. Good. Okay. Now, so we've got CO2 and H2O. So all of the carbon comes from the atmosphere as a gas, right? Some of the oxygen comes from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. A little more of the oxygen comes from the, from the ground as, as water that are absorbed from the ground by the tree's roots, right? Okay, now, okay, so we're almost done here, I promise. Carbon dioxide and hydrogen, or carbon dioxide and water, or H2O, are very stable molecules. In other words, those atoms are held together by really, really tight bonds. And so they've got to be torn together and resynthesized into long chain carbon molecules like glucose. How does that happen? Or in other words, where does the energy come from for that CO2 molecule and that, and that water molecule to break apart and be recombined into long chain carbon molecules? But what is the energy that drives photosynthesis, the sun, right? So what we just talked about there is, if you can tell, that, that excites me. And it's one of the miracles of nature that happens to create wood that we can build with. Um, so 
So that's a fascination of mine. And hopefully the point of that, all that was, hopefully some of that would, would convey to you and get you excited about the possibilities of building with this very fascinating miracle of nature that we call, that we call wood. Okay. So Texas A&M Forest Service, um, well, we're gonna start here. Our mission is to provide statewide leadership to ensure the state's forests and related natural resources are protected and sustained for the benefit of all. Our agency has two divisions. Uh, we have a wildfire and emergency response division. So we're responsible for uh, statewide management of uh, all wildfires and a lot of uh, emergencies that we that we have in our state. Uh, we also have the natural resource side who is responsible for uh, sustaining forests and related resources. That's the, the division that, that I happen to work for in the resource analysis and economics program. Uh, one of the things that, that we do, one of the things that I do as a big part of my job is uh, economic development. In other words, we, uh, we uh, promote existing and new uh, markets for the timber resources in our state. Um, some of the new building materials uh, and, and, and related technologies uh, you're gonna hear about today, uh, they actually have mass timber and, and specifically Southern yellow pine cross laminated timber have the potential to disrupt concrete and steel approaches to construction. Um, a big question is, well, if, if this happens, if we do kind of uh, cut into some of those more conventional methods of construction, uh, can the forest actually sustain that increased demand for, for trees? Um, our goal as an agency is Texas grown Southern yellow pine and cross laminated timber manufacturing in our state. And so what I'd like to do next is to kind of give you a snapshot of what forestry uh, and industry currently look like in, in our state. We have 62.1 million acres of forest and woodland in, uh, in our state, believe it or not. Uh, now, of that 62.1 million acres, there's a special uh, classification of forest that we call timberland. Uh, in our, in our, the, the definition that we, that we use uh, is that timberland produces at least 20 cubic feet of wood per acre per year. We have 13 and a half million acres of timberland statewide. The large majority of that timberland is located in East Texas, uh, uh, what we call the Piney Woods of, of East Texas. Um, and so this is where the majority of our commercial timberland and related industries are in, in our state. Um, believe it or not, despite the, uh, the construction and the development of uh, major cities and outlying areas in our state, there has been a slight increase in uh, forest land, uh, timberland over the last 30 years. Um, and this, this, this one of the things that we do as part of the resource analysis program uh, is to track the amount of timberland. It's one of the key indicators of sustainability is how much forest land do we have and are we at least maintaining a, a certain level? And, and there has been a, a slight increase uh, over the last 30 years. Um, there has been some development, forest loss in the southeastern part of the state. So uh, primarily north of Houston, but that has been more than offset by uh, the conversion of pasture land and uh, other non-forest uses back to forest land uh, in the northeastern part of the state. Um, in this graph, you can see, uh, I have it broken down by uh, hardwood mixed and pine. Uh, take note particularly to the area of pine, which is here in orange, and note the area of pine has actually increased over the past 30 years by about 32%. Um, this re reflects uh, very deliberate investment on the part of landowners in preparing their site and planting pines or new, new pine plantation with the objective of eventually selling those trees for profit. One really important uh, fact about forest land in Texas and really across the South 
is the large majority of timber land is in private ownership. Uh, and more than half is owned by family forest, uh, for family forest landowners. So individual family forests. So maybe you have family in, in East Texas that, that owns forest land. So this, uh, this big chunk here of the, of the pie chart there in blue would reflect that type of forest land owner. Much of what was owned by industry uh, prior to 2000 uh, was divested and is now owned by institutional investment organizations like timber management organizations and real estate investment trusts. So um, those two type of forest land owner are also a, a major type of forest land owner in, in East Texas. Okay, back to that, that question that I posed in the beginning, as we look ahead to a time when um, we're not just building light frame houses and uh, medium scale uh, commercial to a time when we're actually replacing concrete and steel with mass timber and hopefully Southern yellow pine cross laminated timber if Texas is to both be a significant market for that kind of material and producer of that material to where we're getting those trees from our own state, can the timber resource sustain that level of production? Well, we think it can. Um, this chart is a, a little, little intimidating. I, I'd ask you to just kind of ignore the, the hardwoods um, the point of this is to, is to demonstrate to you that we grow a lot more than we cut. Um, so on the left here is the amount of between 2013 and 2018. Um, during that, that time period, we're growing about 38% more pine than we're harvesting on an annual basis. So uh, what we like, we, we call this the growth to removal ratio. And so we like that to at least be one. So a one would represent that we're growing as much as we're removing, okay? And we like it to be actually a little bit higher because that what that means is there's opportunities for additional development. So we think uh, that there is much more timber being grown. Uh, we know that there's much more being grown than, than is actually being harvested. And that represents an opportunity to harvest more. Um, to kind of put that into perspective, who, who, who here is from East Texas? Okay, well, if you're in East Texas, um, chances are, uh, if, you're, if you're traveling uh, in any of the, 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 the towns where uh, there's significant forest industry, this is a common site. Uh, that's a load of pulp wood, wood that's, that's used for paper making. This is a very common site. This is just outside of Lufkin. And that truck, on that truck, what, Brent, about, probably about 30 tons. Those trucks carry about 30 to, to, to 33 tons. At 30, 30 to 33 tons in East Texas, in, that, in those 11.9 million acres of timberland in East Texas that I just told you about, at this rate of growth, we grow across the 11.9 million acres of East Texas, we grow one of those truckloads of wood every 19 seconds in East Texas. And to kind of put that into further context for you, this is the Anderson Ball Classroom building in Pasadena, Texas. Yes, uh, Texas A&M University, little old San Jacinto College was the first university in your state to build a classroom building out of mass timber. Uh, glue lamb, beams, columns, and uh, southern uh, 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 cross laminated timber for the floor and, and uh, the floor plates and the, and the roof. Yes, that's, that's a knock on, on Texas A&M. There is about 120,000 square feet of space in this classroom building. And it took 1,556 tons of black spruce, blue lamb, and CLT to construct this building. For the amount of timber that went into this building, if you take 
the figure that I just showed you, that one truckload of wood, about 32 to 33 tons every 19 seconds, it would take the 11.9 million acres of timberland in East Texas 20 minutes to grow the amount of wood that it, take, that it took to, to build that building. Now, uh, our friends to the north uh, would, would, would tell you, well, it took the Canadian boreal forest only four and a half minutes. Well, yeah, that, that's impressive, but not when you consider that there's 1.2 billion acres of boreal forest. It would take East Texas 20 minutes to grow the same amount of, of timber. Now I tell you that, oh, and, and, and the reason for, for that is this. This is a cross section. This is the end grain of a piece of black spruce from the boreal forest. I've got a, I've got a sample here. I think this is the very sample that I took the picture from. Uh, and the rings are really, really tight. Those trees grow really, really slow. Um, the bottom picture is a piece of loblolly pine. Look how wide those, those rings are. That's the reason. Um, and all that to say that when we get to a point where we're building whatever kind of building, whether it's, whether it's residential homes, whether it's uh, medium scale uh, commercial or large scale buildings like the one we're in, or even bigger, when we get to that kind of, when we get to, to, to that time period, the wood can't come from anywhere except the Southern United States, the wood basket of the nation for, for this very reason. Okay, a little bit more information about the, the forest industries in, in East Texas. We have uh, 44 sawmills currently, um, but that number is, is growing and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. We have seven plywood and OSB mills. We are a significant producer of both lumber and structural panel. Uh, we have four pulp and paperboard mills, two chip mills and one pellet mill that produces pellets um, for for energy. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of how much lumber we're producing. So lumber would be, uh, is, a, is an important resource when we get to the point where we're actually uh, producing uh, uh, cross laminated timber in, in, in this state. This is where it would be coming from. Uh, over, and this is one of the things we do in our, in our agency. We, we survey our mills every, every year, we ask them uh, how much wood they're utilizing in terms of round wood and what they're doing with it. And of those uh, 44 sawmills over uh, the last 10 years, we're producing about 1.5 billion board feet. Uh, the large majority of that is pine at 1.3 billion uh, board feet and uh, much less hardwood, but we do produce some uh, hardwood lumber in our state. So what does that mean to the East Texas economy? Uh, well, uh, we do periodic, uh, every other year we do economic contribution analysis. And in 2021, uh, the forest sector in East Texas contributed $21.4 billion in direct economic output. Um, and the forest sector represents uh, one of the top 10 manufacturing sectors in this state. The forest sector contributed uh, 68,000 direct jobs, ranking first in the South with a payroll of $4.3 billion, which, which is second uh, in the South among the 13 Southern states. Timber actually ranks seventh among Texas top agricultural commodities. So as we kind of look down the road, the global demand for lumber products is very strong. Uh, the director, the, the, uh, Tom Bogus was the director of the Texas a and Forest Service until uh, just a few months ago. And he made a comment shortly before he left uh, that in his, I think, 45 year career that he's never seen interest in the forest products uh, industries like, like he sees today. And the, and the reason is that forests and the built environment are seen as natural climate solutions. Um, just to kind of circle back to industries in our state, uh, we are developing, kind of going back to this idea that we're growing a lot more than we're producing. Uh, just 
kind of some recent announcements. Uh, Royal Martin is one of the big oriented strand board producers in our state. They recently announced an expansion of their Corrigan, Texas facility. Uh, they anticipate a 70% increase in production uh, or 500 million additional square feet of oriented strand board per year. Uh, Sterling started producing, uh, they're a, a CLT uh, cross laminated timber mat producer. Uh, they have a facility in Chicago. Uh, they recently located in Lufkin, Texas, uh, near uh, the next company that I have listed there, Angelina Forest Products in Lufkin. This, this slide needs to change. Uh, they are now a, uh, they were bought out for, uh, by, by Wes Fraser. So it's not Angelina Forest Products anymore. They are a Wes Fraser company. Um, they built in, and, and began manufacturing in 2020. They are a 300 plus million board foot sawmill there in Lufkin. And these two companies kind of kind of share a property or they're, they're co-located. Co uh, Lincoln Lumber recently announced plans to construct a, a sawmill facility in Crockett, Texas. And then uh, more recently, the Georgia Pacific Pineland Sawmill uh, announced an upgrade uh, where they plan to increase from 380 to 450 million board foot uh, annually. And then of course, mass timber and specifically cross laminated timber made out of Southern yellow pine is one of those uh, emerging markets that we're, that we're tracking very closely. And uh, Mark Bartlett with Woodworks is gonna come and uh, talk more about the, the benefits of, of CLT. Uh, that's something that we're very interested in, um, but, but something that, that Mark is, a, is an expert in. So, so look forward to that. Um, so as, as I kind of wrap up, uh, I love these kind of open-ended, uh, actually, this is an open-ended question. This one has a, an actual answer. It is, uh, what is the first building in Texas to utilize Southern yellow pine mass timber panels? Uh, Tate, you are not eligible because I know you know the answer. I'm not convinced that you know the answer, Mark Bartlett. The first building in Texas to utilize Southern yellow pine mass timber panels. Anyone have an idea? It's kind of a trick question. Okay. What happens to be the Fulton Mansion in Rockport, Texas? Uh, which was completed in, sorry about that, 1877. Um, and there's a reason why that building is standing, having been, been there since 1877 in a part of the world uh, that experiences so many hurricanes on a pretty regular basis. Uh, and that is because the walls were constructed out of nail laminated pine panels. Uh, it's said that each one of the walls, and this is a, uh, I don't know what you would call this take, uh, kind of, uh, okay, a section diagram. Uh, it's said that each of the walls in the Fulton Mansion contains enough lumber to build a small house. There's a lot of wood in, in this building, and, and it's a, uh, it, it had been damaged uh, over the course of time by some hurricanes, um, but it, it's never failed and, it, and it's still standing. There are certain barriers uh, to widespread adoption of cross laminated timber systems. Uh, and one of my main interests uh, and the Texas A&M Forest Service supports uh, several initiatives that I'm involved in to promote the awareness and acceptance of mass timber and specifically Southern yellow pine cross laminated timber. Um, so uh, we have several projects that target uh, key influencers like building owners and developers, design and construction professionals and code officials. And I would say that uh, I would consider all of you uh, sitting in this room and, and participating online at, among those influencers. Uh, I suspect that all of you aspire uh, or, uh, to be designers yourself. Uh, and so I would, I would uh, include you as, uh, as among that important list of, of influencers, which is, which is why I like coming 
and talking to the students. One of the things that we're doing is producing a video series. Uh, I believe, uh, Mark, I, I believe that uh, your students have seen a couple of those videos uh, that focuses on some of the key benefits of mass timber. Um, the way we're, uh, we're designing this is that we focus on uh, benefits, including the cost viability of, of mass timber, the design versatility, aesthetics, uh, and, and biophilia, the structural capacity, environmental sustainability. Uh, and then we're actually producing four building specific videos. Mark's gonna talk about some of the buildings in Texas that, that uh, feature mass timber. Uh, you've seen a, a few of those. What I'd like to do uh, just to kind of wrap up is to, to show you one additional video that we're calling the overview video. Uh, that comes back to this idea of Texas as a potential key market and producer of southern yellow pine cross laminated timber. Uh, so the video lasts about about three minutes. Um, and at the conclusion of, of the video, uh, I guess it'll be Mark's turn. Uh, next slide. And then if you just click on the, on the picture. Texas is a region where traditionally we build a lot out of concrete, but what a lot of people don't realize is that there's a lot of wood in Texas as well. And that material obviously is really natural material. Local manufacturing is the LP. Extraordinarily beneficial. Mass timber is in its infancy. We selected a supplier that was in Canada. So Canada, we had to bring 23 rail car loads of timber from Canada to Houston, Texas, put it on 74 trucks, and bring it to the site. And that meant that our mass timber cost, about 20% of that was represented by freight. We had a supplier that was able to take advantage of the 13 million acres of timberland in East Texas. That freight cost could have been less than 5% of the total cost of the wood fiber that it purchased. If this takes hold and if it becomes something real, there are mass timber manufacturers that involve in East Texas that we can be returning to East Texas and economic potential that hasn't been there for two generations at least. That will help grow the state and grow this region of the state. No one is more intentional or better steward of the land than the Texas mass timber. You have to have the Texas mindset. The trees that you harvest are going to be replaced by trees that you probably won't get to harvest yourself. Products like cross laminated timber made out of southern yellow pine, which connects that whole building from the tree planter to the forest land owner to the forestry to the harvesting tree to the folks that work in the air. They each have effects on that facility. We are excited about having a market like this to be able to talk about with our forest landowners that are using carbon. You know, you get the forest as forest, pass it on to the next generation. You know, have native down Texas trees in a product that goes in the field and knows what it is in Texas, knowing that that wood is from Texas soil, usually of the sky.
All right, so, uh, you know, so thank you, Aaron. That really sets the kind of stage for understanding how this uh, technology fits into the state of Texas. Now, uh, the next speaker is Mark Bartlett. Uh, Mark is the Texas Regional Director for Woodworks, a nonprofit that provides free one-on-one -on -one project assistance related to the, still gonna work, I think so, related to the code compliant design, engineering, and construction of wood buildings. Mark received his BS in civil engineering with an emphasis in structures from Lehigh University as a re registered professional engineer in Texas and Oklahoma. He has over 20 years of experience in structural engineering and has worked with project teams to provide technical support on more than 150 projects since joining Woodworks in 2017. So, uh, uh, so we'll turn it over to Mark Bartlett to talk about Texas completed projects using advanced wood products. All right, so before I get started, any other engineers in the room? All right, excellent. All right, we can nerd out later. All right, excellent. Uh, so, uh, here we go. So yeah, so I'm gonna talk about mass timber uh, and I'm gonna talk about some of the projects that we have going on in Texas. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about mass timber is that in, in the construction industry, nothing really new seems to happen. Uh, you know, we've come up with all kinds of advanced prefabrication techniques and you may see videos of machines that are, are 3D printing houses with concrete and things of that nature. But none of that stuff is really uh, being seen with widespread spread use. And that's what I think we're seeing with mass timber. And it's really been uh, adopted uh, across the country and, and across the globe. And I think it has a really bright future uh, when we start to look at mass timber, especially here in the Texas market. So uh, I'm going to bore everyone real quickly and talk about the building codes because that's really important part of, of mass timber. Then I'm gonna talk about the products, benefits, uh, tall wood, and then I'm gonna focus on Texas projects. So if I go fast through any of this stuff, I apologize, but I really wanna to get to the projects, but we need to have some, some stuff up front because some of you may still be thinking, what exactly is CLT? I don't know what exactly it is you're talking about. Now you might've gotten some images from it. So, so in essence, the building code controls everything we do. And that's, I can say that's a good thing. I can say it's a bad thing. If you ever work with the building code, it's a very frustrating document. So, but the, in the building code, it tells us what we can build with. Uh, and all these options are available, wood, concrete, steel, masonry, and so forth. Uh, it tells us how tall, it tells us how big we can build it. And it tells us how, what kind of fire resistance we have. And when we talk about building with wood, then we really wanna pay attention to what kind of fire resistance that we're gonna be dealing with. So when you talk about the construction types in the code, type one construction is all the really tall buildings that we see in the high rise markets. Non-combustible construction only, uh, and it's going to be really expensive. So you typically don't see a ton of skyscrapers because they tend to be really expensive. Uh, you go to type two construction and that's still non-combustible. It's all going to be concrete and steel, but it's going to be a little bit more appropriately sized for what we see on a large scale basis. Uh, so heights up to six stories and 85 feet uh, and up to a two hour rating. But if you go shorter, you can sometimes get away with a zero hour rating depending on the size of the project. When you get into type three construction, that's when you start to see combustible materials being allowed. Uh, one thing I want you to note though, is it's heights it up to 60 stories and 85 feet, same as type two construction, uh, but yet we still see some preferences of going for concrete and steel when you could technically build things out of wood. But in the past, we always thought about building out of wood as stick frame. And I think now that's what mass timber allows us to think about it as in terms of similar types of structures that we would out of concrete and steel. So type three, what are we talking about? We're talking about apartments and some schools and hotels and maybe some small office buildings. These are all wood buildings. Sometimes it's all covered up. Uh, sometimes it's gonna be exposed, uh, you know, and sometimes it's you know, all hidden within the walls between units of an apartment. Type four construction, that's called heavy timber construction. And I think that's what a lot of people automatically default to when they think of mass timber. Large wood elements, it fits within this heavy timber construction type. Uh, but type four construction is not something that was used a lot in the past. And so a lot of architects aren't familiar with some of the, the, the idiosyncrasies of type four construction. For example, if you wanna use concrete or steel in type four, the code is silent on how to address those non-combustible materials. Uh, if you wanna do concealed spaces, if you wanna hide any of the MEP equipment, 
You can't do that in type four up until the most recent version of the code. So there were some things that you had to really deal with in type four, but in general, people thought of it as this heavy timber construction, but we also wanna make sure that we consider some of the other construction types that have uh, allow uh, combustible materials. So type four buildings, mixed use, higher education, office, uh, all the pretty much standard stuff that we see in type four. And then type five, we're starting to get smaller now. We're, we're only gonna be limited to four stories and 70 feet. So this is some of the smaller projects that you'll come across, least con expensive construction type, restaurants, small apartment buildings, retail strip centers, that's kind of thing that's covered in type five construction. That being said, a lot of mass timber buildings fit really well within type five if they are small enough, if they are under 70 feet, if they're under four stories, if they don't have a big area, this allows for zero hour fire ratings. It allows for much cheaper construction. So again, we can't ignore this type five, even though we think of it as light frame construction, it's really for anything. All right, so the other big difference is the difference between light frame construction and mass timber construction. Uh, and I can't stress this enough. And I think this is a lot of the problem that the building officials have is when they think of mass timber and they think of wood, this is all they think about because this is all that we've been building with for hundreds of, or not hundreds of years, but 50 to 100 years. Uh, and so in essence, it performs so much differently in a fire. And I think that's the most important thing. Uh, because when you talk about mass timber elements, you're talking about these large elements that do not catch fire very easily, will self-extinguish if there is not more fuel brought to the fire and that allows for an inherent fire resistance of these large scale elements. And I think that's how they, these two types of buildings perform differently. And the other thing that we have to compare is traditional heavy timber versus modern mass timber. So if you've ever been in a warehouse district in a large city, you'll see a lot of old heavy timber wood buildings that might've been converted to office spaces or retail spaces, things of that nature. Uh, these are buildings that were built in the turn of the century. For those of you who weren't born in the previous century, I'm talking about 1900, not 2000. So, uh, so these are buildings that are 100 to 120 years old. And they have these, these huge columns and beams that were cut from a single tree. Uh, and we can't do that anymore. Uh, for one thing, uh, it takes too long for these large trees to grow before we can harvest them and turn them into these large elements. So instead, what we're, what we're cutting down and what we're using for lumber is smaller diameter trees. Uh, and we're making two bi-dimensional lumber. But what mass timber does is it allows us to uh, repurpose those individual laminations into larger scale elements uh, and rebuild that into a big beam or a big column. The other thing about these old buildings though, is that they were not designed for the modern amenities. They were not designed for a lot of natural daylight. They were not designed for sound attenuation. If you've ever been in some of these old buildings, they are, you know, you can hear people walking around and things of that nature. They look great. Tenants love these buildings. I've talked to developers that own buildings like this. Tenants move in, they love it. And then 12 months later, they move out because they don't have the good elevators. They don't have good natural daylight, things of that nature. So what mass timber allows us to do is to create these new buildings that have this great aesthetic, but it also allows us to have a lot of natural daylight. It allows us to have all the modern amenities that we want within these building types. All right, so what are the products that we're talking about here? We've heard CLT mentioned a lot, uh, and it is certainly probably the most popular of all the mass timber products. Uh, glue lamb beams and columns, they've been around for a long time. Uh, they're pretty well defined within the code, uh, and they're certainly used you know, for our columns and our beams and so forth. CLT though is the new, the new kid on the block, I guess, if you wanna call it that. Uh, invented in Austria in the mid 1990s, uh, really expanded in the European market, uh, moved over to Canada, and now has, has, has made its way here into the United States. So uh, CLT is probably the most uh, dominant one uh, with the most manufacturers, but it's certainly not the only one. And the other one we've got here on this uh, slide here is cross laminated timber with what we call uh, structural composite lumber laminations. Uh, if you've ever seen plywood, just think of plywood and plywood and plywood and plywood and plywood until it's basically uh, the same kind of thickness that we see with a cross laminated timber product. Uh, there's really only one manufacturer of it right now, and it has a much different visual aesthetic uh, than CLT does. So CLT, you're going to see the individual flat uh, boards, whereas this, you're going to basically be looking at four by eight sheets of plywood as your finished product. So uh, sometimes we've seen these project uh, products right here being used when they're actually going to be covered up, uh, but they're, they're, they're still a very effective product. 
The older style of construction uh, is nail laminated timber here in the middle, where you have the laminations stacked vertically and mechanically connected together. Uh, a newer version of that is called dowel laminated timber, where you use hardwood dowels to make those connections. Uh, and then also a uh, similar vertical laminations, but glued together instead of man, uh, manually connected or mechanically connected is glue laminated timber. Like I said, used for beams and columns, but if you rotate it 90 degrees and you make it four feet wide, it can be used as floor systems as well. So we've seen that in some limited scope uh, as well. All right, so what does a panel look like? Uh, so here's a big panel. Uh, it's gonna span about 10 to 20 feet. Uh, but it can be made up to 60 feet long. So it's gonna span over multiple supports. So the key to this is that you can lay a lot of square footage at one time. So it makes construction go a lot faster. Uh, the structural strength is not actually what controls. What controls is vibration and deflection. Uh, so when we talk about fire design, we have the ability for that extra strength built in, even if we lose some of that wood in a fire. Uh, and then acoustics are the other thing that's gonna control panel design. Uh, if anyone's been in an old wood building where you can hear people walking around and it sounds like everyone's right next door, that's not what we want in our modern buildings. And so the wood by itself is not enough to get good acoustic properties. We're going to have to do more to it to make sure that we've got good sound attenuation between floors and between spaces. Now, the other thing is fire resistance. It provides its own inherent fire resistance. That's the, sort of the neat thing about mass timber is that it provides the structure so the building can stand up. It provides the finish for what the occupants are going to see. And then if necessary, it provides its own fire resistance. So you don't have to, so that skips some of the steps in traditional construction. The floor system itself, we're not gonna walk on a CLT floor. Uh, I only know of one project in the country that does it. And I think it's a really bad idea. <laughs> uh, that project actually is a multifamily and they mounted toilets and bathtubs directly to the wood floor. And you know, the other thing that we have to worry about with wood is not necessarily fire, but it's also moisture. So. Uh, be very careful about moisture around wood or around any building material for that fact. I mean, we've seen uh, tragedies occur with other building materials based on water uh, infiltration. So anyway, so what do we have? What's on the top? Whatever you want to put on the top. You want to put carpet, you want to put tile, you want to put hardwood flooring, whatever. That goes on the top. Uh, any underlayment if applicable. Uh, and then below that, we're going to have a topping slab. Uh, that topping slab provides a couple of purposes. It helps the sound attenuation. It also helps the the stability of these panels, uh, the vibration characteristics of the panel. So when you're walking in a CLT building, you think you're just walking in a concrete building. It feels that stable and secure. Uh, and then below that, acoustical mat. We wanna make sure that we've got good sound quality uh, for impact transmission and sound transmission. So we typically have an acoustical mat. In some cases, I've heard of the acoustical mat not being used, but then more concrete is added to it. So it's a, a trade-off of materials. And then below that is whatever your mass timber floor panel is going to be. So let's see one of these panels uh, in action. Uh, this is from a project in San Antonio called the Soto. Uh, I've sped up it up a little bit. One of the things you'll notice is that these panels are prefabricated. So you'll see some notches in these panels. All of this work is done in the factory. When these panels are delivered to a job site, they're simply stacked and stored. And then when they're ready to go, you put up the lifting hooks and you lift it in the air and you set it down. There's no cutting. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, manipulation of these panels. You don't have to typically core through them for any penetrations. All that is typically done in the factory. Uh, and the benefit of that is that one, it reduces the amount of labor on a job site. Uh, you can see there were two guys on the ground. There's going to be two guys up in the air and another guy helping to manipulate the panels into place. And then somebody operating the crane. We're not talking about skilled labor here. We're talking about a, a, a labor force that is uh, read, readily available to us. Uh, and not required, uh, you know, a ton of guys to run out there and uh, tie up concrete rebar and things of that nature. You'll see everything sort of fits perfectly too. That's the other nature of mass timber is that we typically have really detailed Revit models uh, that allow everything to fit together very precisely out in the field. I've got some images from some of these jobs where you just simply can't get that kind of quality out of concrete or steel when everything's being assembled together. So here you can see uh, it fits perfectly around the column. Uh, and it's going to be dropped into place. They each are going to have little pry bars up there to manipulate the panel into its final resting place. The other thing about wood is that it has really great strength to weight ratio. So these panels are not heavy in terms of uh, comparison to other materials. Um, it allows for guys to manipulate it with just, you know, a little brute force. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So there, so that's basically a panel that goes in. All right, so why do we want to do mass timber? Uh, concrete and steel seem to have been doing fine for all these years. Well, why do we want to do this mass timber stuff? Well, I think we all need to be very concerned about what's happening in our environment. And there are certain things that, that we can do uh, as part of the design community. Uh, we all know that if we wait for our governments of the world to come and address this and, and resolve all of our issues, it's probably going to be too late. So that's one thing that we can do in the construction industry is we can start building out of more sustainable building material uh, and start shifting some of that carbon from our environment and storing it within the buildings that we built. Uh, so when we talk about embodied carbon and we talk about wood versus other materials, there's really just no comparison between them. Uh, wood is a far superior material, obviously pulling that carbon out of our environment and storing it within the buildings uh, that we hopefully will have for a very long time. So when you talk about weight, you know, wood is 40% or 50% carbon uh, by weight. There's the C. I was going to make a joke about having no chemistry questions for you guys. Dang, I forgot about my joke. All right, no chemistry questions. Uh, I'll, I won't mention carbon again. Uh, so anyway, but it, it does store it. Uh, and it basically holds it in there within that building. Uh, now, I know people will come and say like, well, eventually it's going to come out of that wood. We're going to tear that building down someday. And then it's going to release that carbon back in the environment. Well, you know where the carbon came from? The atmosphere. So all we're doing is we have a closed loop system. We're not generating a ton of extra carbon through the manufacturing process. We have some, but it's not like the other materials. So that allows us to sort of close that loop of carbon uh, and keep it stored and not increase the, the total amount in our uh, atmosphere. So, which is basically what this is. All right, I'm gonna skip through this. All right, this is the other really cool thing about mass timber. You know, <sighs> I don't want to criticize our nice concrete pan joist building that we're in right here. Um, but I've been in a ton of concrete pan joist buildings and I've been in a few mass timber buildings and there's really no comparison. You know, my first week on the job at Woodworks, I went out to California and I walked a project called Ice Block. It's a mass timber building in Sacramento. And I, I had such a stupid kid grin on my face as I walked through a job site. Uh, and I've walked through a million job sites over my career, and I just, the smell, and they, they were using it for the stair stringers, and it was wood everywhere. And I was just like, I made an absolute great choice to come work for Woodworks because I love this stuff. I mean, this is really impactful to work in a space like this and to get the, the sort of, the, and when you talk about biophilia, it's sort of this ethereal term, I think, that we throw around a lot. But it's just basically this, this experience of working with natural materials and in these environments where you have uh, a reduced stress level and you, you interact with the natural material. I mean, how many times do you go up to a, a building like this and if there's an exposed concrete column, would you want to just touch and feel the concrete, right? First of all, it's going to be dusty and it's going to be gross. Every time I go into a mass timber building, it's just like you run your hand across the wood. And, and if you're like, really wood nerd like me, you'll take pictures hugging the columns and things of that nature, you know. Um, it's just, a, it's a different experience when, when you're in these structures. So it just, it gives you this, uh, this warm feeling, I think, when you're in a, in a mass timber building. So um, here's a, a sort of an example. I hate this project to be, or this picture actually, because whoever would, would think this is an appropriate finished material in a, in, a, in a living space, you know, there'd be some drywall ceiling or something, which isn't gonna be that much better. But obviously in this type of space, you know, your, your, your structure is up and it's done. Uh, and it allows you to, to have that natural warmth of the wood within the space. So like I said earlier, labor. We're, God, we're running into labor shortages everywhere, uh, but in the construction industry as well. Uh, and when you put together a mass timber building, you really do not need a large labor force. If you've ever been to a job site where they're pouring concrete, there's like worker ants everywhere, all over the place, tying rebar together and putting things in place. You go to a mass timber job site and you're going to see six guys uh, or, or girls. I'm sorry. I need to be better about that. Six people putting that building together. Uh, it doesn't require a ton of labor to put it all together. So it's, it's, a, it's a much easier and simpler process. The other thing that's great about it is when you start to get into decent sized projects, it is so much faster to put together. Uh, you know, this is a project here where they did a comparison of uh, a, a post-tension concrete versus a mash timber project. And it was about five months of less schedule for a, I believe this was a 12 story building that they did this uh, comparison on. Uh, if you're an owner and you wanna have shave five months off of your construction schedule, you're saving five months of money is what you're basically doing. Uh, and so that's another big advantage of mass timber. 
So the building code was something that we had to address. Uh, the 2015 code was the first one that included mass timber in it. Uh, and every three years, we're constantly working to try and improve what we have. The biggest, biggest thing that happened was in the 2021 building code. Now, even though it's 2022, how many jurisdictions within Texas have adopted the 2021? Austin has. And as a consequence, the University of Texas has. I just might have had a conversation about that this morning. No, no pressure at all. But uh, um, yeah, so you know, we don't have a lot of adoption of this new building code. But when the new building code Remember when I talked about wood and mass timber, six stories, 85 feet was as tall as we could go. Now we can go 18 stories and 270 feet in height. Now, granted, this one, they got to cover all the wood up, which is a little unfortunate. Uh, but this type 4B, where you can go 12 stories and 180 feet, uh, this one allows exposed mass timber. And in the next version of the code, the 2024, we're going to allow 100% exposure of mass timber, which is really exciting because we've done some new fire testing to prove that it'll work. That's gonna really expand the, the open uh, or the availability of projects for mass timber, especially when we start to get into some of the taller structures. So let's talk about what we've got happening in Texas, because I think we've got some really cool buildings. Uh, who here has been in a mass timber building? There's a few hands going up. All right, excellent. Good, so we have some in Texas, and if you get an opportunity, I highly recommend you go inside and you visit one, because if you haven't, you're gonna, you're gonna regret it. If you don't, if, I mean, it's just, it, I know I'm geeking out here about wood, but it's, it's really cool to walk through these mass timber buildings. So I'll talk about one here uh, real quick, or uh, this is the project in Sherman, Texas. Uh, it's a first United Bank headquarters. It's a pretty generic two-story office building. You know, there's nothing uh, outstanding about it. Uh, it's got a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, cantilevers. You architects love the cantilevers, right? Can I get it in thinner? Can I get the cantilever thinner? Uh, and then the engineers over there going like, ah, yeah, yeah, I think you can. I, um, I got to stand up for my engineers here. Um, but, you know, it's one of these things where you can get really a great place, you know, a, a great, you know, space. All right. Uh, so here's the construction photos of it. Uh, you know, we've got a lot of uh, really large glue laminated beams. We've got some decent cantilevers. Cross laminated timber does allow you to cantilever uh, in both axes, although one is a strong axis, so it can cantilever a little bit more. One is a weak axis, so it's a little bit less of a cantilever. Uh, here's the, the image that I want to talk to you about how everything fits together. You know, here we have uh, beams and columns all fitting together uh, very precisely, very tightly. All of these bolts have to line up. We can't do that under traditional methodology. We have to do that with very precision. Uh, CNC machinery that is tied into the Revit model that we're creating. Uh, if any of you have interned at companies and you had to check shop drawings, who's here had to been able to check shop drawings? No, not many. One of these days, we'll get to check shop drawings and you sit there and go like, why did I pick this as a career? This is, yeah. Anyway, so the shop drawing process is where each individual manufacturer uh, comes up with their little component of the building. So there's, there's a wood guy, there's a concrete guy, there's a steel guy. They all have their drawings that just talk about their stuff. Uh, it takes a little bit longer in a mass timber project because you've got to make sure that all this stuff is perfect. I mean, here we have some, some roof drains that are coming through here. We've got these penetrations that are already pre-drilled within the structure. Everything looks nice. You know, these are all going to be exposed. So when you have these things, it has to look good. Uh, field drilled holes are not going to look the same as a CNC machine in a factory. Uh, it's just not going to look as good. So here's uh, some of the uh, connections closer up, beam to column connection. Here's the penetration through one of the glue lambs. That's one of the things that is a little bit tricky when you deal with mass timber is when you gotta you know, have things run through the beams. Uh, you can't just do it willy nilly. It's a little bit more flexible with steel. With mass timber, you gotta be a little bit more precise. The manufacturer will come in here and, and, and see and see the hole in that glue lamb, but then they're gonna come back in with these large screws and reinforce around the opening. And then here we can see some of the cantilevers. Here's a really short cantilever, that's CLT in its weak axis. And then here we see the long cantilever, that's CLT in its strong axis. All right, here's another project uh, in San Antonio called the Soto. Uh, this is not cross laminated timber. This one is actually dowel laminated timber. So it looks a little bit different. Uh, we'll go back here and here you can see the, the flat edges of the boards. Whereas in this project here, we're gonna be seeing the thin edges of the boards. Uh, so this is a six story office building. Uh, and it's a great example of what you can do with mass timber. 
this is the uh, upper space uh, for the uh, whoever pays the most rent and gets the best space within the building on the upper floor. Uh, and as you can see here, the one thing that we don't really see in this is a lot of clutter from the mechanical and electrical and plumbing equipment, right? So where is all of it? Because this is the finished product right here. Where, where did they hide everything? Exactly. It's all on the floor. So you can sort of see right there, there's one of the tiles that's missing uh, within the space. They have an eight inch deep raised floor system where all of their, uh, their MEP air is coming through. It's a really innovative system. Um, now this is type four construction. So in type four construction under the old codes, you were not allowed to have concealed spaces. So what they had to do on this project was go to the city and ask for approval if they can do a concealed space. And so they looked, they pointed at some of the newer codes and the city allowed them to do that. Never assume that the city is going to allow you to do something that's not in the building code. Cities are notoriously reluctant to do that, but San Antonio is a good team player. Um, but here you can see uh, the thin edges of the boards uh, in each, between each of the panels. Now you'll notice uh, for this project here, there's a little gap between each of the panels for Dell laminated timber. Does anyone know what that gap is for? Expansion, who said expansion? Excellent. Well, the East Texas guy, right? <laughs> he's, he's dealt with wood before. Wood will expand and contract due to moisture content. So cross laminated timber, by the nature of it being glued up cross laminated as one wants to move, the other one resists the movement because it does not expand and contract over its length, just over its width and its depth. But dowel laminated timber, by its nature of them all stacked vertically, these panels can expand and contract uh, while specifically while they're under construction before the building is dried in and everything sort of stabilizes. So that's what we see here between the DLT panels uh, is that ability to expand and contract. Here's some other images uh, of the Soto. Uh, they have some really cool uh, exterior stainless steel connectors for these exposed. Uh, I believe this is hemlock, uh, a different species for exterior applications. Uh, here's a, a blow up of uh, two beams coming into a column. Uh, ex exterior exposure like this is acceptable in a lot of cases, uh, especially for soffits. Uh, you know, these beams might very well see some rain and, and weather uh, driven sideways. So there are some precautions that need to be taken when you are putting things up that are going to be exposed to weather. So these guys right here, like I said, this was, a, I believe it's Temlock, a different species that's more naturally durable, uh, and it should require less maintenance. If you put, uh, unfortunately, southern yellow pine in exterior application, you would have to have a lot more maintenance to make it maintain and not have it uh, look dated or weathered, I guess. And then this is a, a finished conference room within the space. Uh, as you can see, when a tenant comes in, all they're really selecting is the lights because more or less everything else uh, is kind of done with those spaces. Here's an interesting project in Austin called 901 East 6th Street because this is not a fully mass timber building. This is a steel mass timber hybrid. Uh, and this is something that I think uh, is always gonna have its place because when you talk about mass timber buildings and you talk about where you can locate columns, uh, 30 by 30 column grid is about as big as we've seen. Uh, steel can go farther than that. So if you want less columns within your space, then you have to go to another material. Now, if you ask me, more timber columns is a plus, uh, but you know, I'm not the only one that wants to have a timber column that I have to stroll my chair around at my desk space. I don't know. Uh, I think that'd be awesome. But anyway, so this is a steel building. Uh, so in this case here, uh, steel structure uh, with CLT floors. Uh, and this was uh, an interesting project uh, in that it was the first project for the architecture team and they did not embrace prefabrication. Uh, and later when I talked to them, they actually sort of said, well, we probably should have done a little bit more prefabrication because they had to drill a lot of holes uh, in the field. Uh, but obviously it can still be done really great. Uh, you can see the way they've lit everything with lighting uh, on, the, uh, on the top side of the bottom flanges of these beams, uh, lighting up the, uh, the CLT. Uh, a really attractive space. Now, one thing to note with this, this is a type 3A building. It requires a one hour rating for the primary structural frame. So for the CLT, you basically have to make the CLT a little bit thicker to have what we call a char layer. Uh, and that's, that, that's pretty common. But what do we do for the steel? We have exposed steel. How do you provide a, a fire resistance rating for exposed steel? Galvanizing doesn't provide fire resistance. That's gonna be, who said intumescent paint? There you go. How do you know intumescent paint? <laughs> okay. 
Intumescent paint. Uh, intumescent paint is a paint that when uh, a high heat gets it, it'll like expand and protect the material. Every contractor hates it. It's expensive and it's hard to apply. So keep that in mind if you want to expose the steel as well. I, I toured this job site. The contractor had nothing nice to say about intumescent paint. Uh, it looks good though. Uh, and then here is the, uh, the, the finished spaces within it. Uh, you can see here even, they, they don't have very much when, in the terms of uh, mechanical equipment, but they might've taken this picture to try and eliminate how much it's in there. Uh, but you know, they've got, like I, like I said earlier, they got larger beam penetrations because they can do that with steel a little bit easier uh, than a glue lamb can, uh, but still a very attractive space. So here's one in Plano, Texas, just north of Dallas that uh, went with a slightly different approach in that they only did the roof of the entire building out of mass timber. Uh, now in type 1B and type 2 construction, you can do this. You can just put mass timber in the roof of a building that is then technically only allows non-combustible materials. Uh, there's little footnotes in the, in the code. So if you ever get to a point where you want to know if you can use wood or not, that's what my organization does is figures that out. Uh, so you can sort of see here, uh, the rest of this building is just a pretty boring concrete building. They do have some CLT in the, uh, the canopies uh, and then in the roof space. And again, here's, here's your, you know, let's cantilever it out on both sides. Yeah, that's easy, right? Structural engineering. All right, here's the San Jacinto project. Uh, Aaron already showed this one in his presentation. There's a few things I want to point out to it though. Uh, this one is, I'm going to talk about lateral systems. Who here is excited to hear about lateral systems? Don't raise your hand. Nobody's excited to hear about lateral systems. All right, so in lateral systems, there's a lot of options, all the traditional options for, for structures. In this case here, we've got wood being used as a lateral system. It's a big x braced frame uh, and it's gonna be exposed. This is all gonna be windows here and allows that lateral system to be exposed. There's also uh, steel braced frames that are hidden within walls uh, on this project as well. So here, <laughs> this was really interesting. Uh, this is one of their larger sort of lab or uh, a room like this space. Uh, where they wanted to have, they needed to have the mechanical equipment running through all these beams. So this is some of the largest beam penetrations that I've ever seen in a mass timber uh, glue lamb beam. And then in this inset up here, you can see this is where the duct work is sort of running through each one of those penetrations. This is really unusual. When I saw this, my first reaction was, I don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Uh, but the manufacturer assured us that everything was fine. So, uh, okay. Uh, it's not my signing and sealing of the drawings, so I don't have to worry about it, but um, that required probably a lot of extensive uh, reinforcement around each one of these openings to make those large openings possible. And then there's a lot of, a lot of cool things you can do with CLT, like stairs. Uh, here's a feature stair within the entry space of the building, uh, utilizing uh, you know, glue lamb columns here with CLT panels rotated on the side, uh, making the stair that goes up within this feature space. And then here's uh, some zoomed in uh, images of those connections for that uh, large wood x -rays. Trinity University. You see any A&M projects up here? I see Trinity and there's a couple going on at Rice. The University of Houston has a couple. Eh, that's all right, okay. Uh, so Trinity University, this one is uh, Dickey Hall. Uh, this is uh, another new building that's gonna be uh, attached to an existing structure. Uh, this one is interesting because if we come back to this image right here, you can see all of these, this is just the rendering here, but all of these columns uh, are exposed uh, on the outside. So uh, this wood right here is all Alaskan yellow cedar. Uh, Alaskan yellow cedar is a naturally de uh, decay resistant species. Um, but when it does decay or when it, when it ages, uh, UV staining occurs and it turns grayish. So what they're doing on this project is they are going to pre-stain all of these columns a gray color so you will never see the UV staining happening and it will look like it's been there for a while. So keep that in mind also is when you're, when you're talking about exterior exposure, you may be looking at different species of wood uh, that are more naturally durable uh, than say uh, like a Southern yellow pine or uh, even Doug fir is not as naturally durable as, as Alaskan yellow cedar. And here's just a few more images. Again, uh, cool things that they can do with the stairs uh, utilizing this material. Oh, one of the other things I didn't want to mention here, so let me go back here real quick. Do, 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 do. Go all the way back. So uh, this guy, where did this mass timber come from? Alabama. Uh, this guy, where did this mass timber come from? Canada. Where did this mass timber come from? Canada. 
Where did this mass timber come from? I can't remember on that one. <laughs> this one, Canada. Uh, so this one here, um, I think some of it came from Alabama. Uh, uh, or uh, um, Yeah, I think it was Smartland that provided this mass timber. Uh, Smartland has plants in Montana and in Alabama, so at least it's domestic. Uh, although Alaskan yellow cedar probably came from another facility, but that's uh, another material. Um, the Hotel Magdalena in Austin uh, is another interesting project. Uh, it's a hybrid. It has light framed walls with mass timber floors uh, within the space. And then it also has exposed exterior uh, DLT floor slabs. So here's an image of it being built. So all these walls in between the units are light framed uh, construction. Uh, and then the floors that are going in are mass timber floors. Now it doesn't look like it because there's this OSB covering up the mass timber, but you'll see it within the interior spaces. So there's your, your space in the hotel uh, that uh, ex allows the exposed uh, DLT. Again, this is DLT construction, Dow laminated timber. Uh, but what's interesting about this is that typically, like I said earlier, we don't walk on this stuff. Uh, we, it's not a hardwood, so it's not a, an awesome wearing surface. But for this project, what they did is they used Dow laminated timber where they included spacers in between the boards to allow those boards to dry out uh, in cases of when it would get wet. Uh, that's the big problem with water is that it gets wet and then it gets trapped and it stays. Whereas this, by allowing those spacers in there, the water will fall through, it allow air circulation and allow that project to, to dry out and maintain. All right, and this was my, gonna be my answer to the first mass timber project in Texas. You got a tech, it's a technicality on there because yours is nail laminated timber and your question said CLT and that would be this one. Does it say mass timber? All right, whatever. <clears throat> All right, so this was the first mass timber project in Texas. And this is just a bank. This is not some elaborate grand uh, structure. Uh, it's a bank. It's a great looking bank, uh, but it's a bank. Um, so here's the, uh, some pictures from the space inside, you know, and this is basically that, that environment that they've created within their, their bank space. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, again, I walked in, this, this project's been built now for three or four years. I walked in there to film some of the stuff for Aaron and uh, I immediately, I could still, I could smell the wood. I could just and then, in, it's instantly smell that I was inside of a wood building. And of course I got a big stupid print on my face. Yeah. Uh, some other interesting projects. This one's still under construction. This is called the Duke in Austin. Uh, this is a mixed use project where we have uh, retail on the lower levels uh, with multifamily above. Uh, and so if you're familiar at all with a lot of mixed use projects, oftentimes this lower level is concrete and they have a podium, a concrete podium. Uh, and above that is all of your light framed construction. Well, in this case here, our lower level, our podium is a mass timber podium. It's all heavy timber. Uh, and so we have, this is a seven ply CLT here. Where did this CLT come from? Europe. Hmm. Could have couldn't have gotten it in East Texas, but instead they shipped it over from Europe. Uh, so seven ply CLT here, allowing for this, uh, you know, for transferring loads from all the par uh, partition walls up there. And then here you can see some of the first level of those uh, light framed walls with CLT floors. Uh, so that, again, they're gonna have CLT exposed within the living spaces up there. Uh, this is on the east side of Austin where it seems like everything's being built uh, in Austin is on the east side. And then lastly, uh, here's a, one in Houston, the Museum of, uh, of Fine Arts, uh, where they utilized, uh, this is like one of the, this is a pretty early project in Texas as well that utilized uh, mass timber. Uh, and so here's some of the spaces within uh, the, the museum here. These are the maker spaces, whatever they call them, where they're working on various works of art uh, and repairing them and things of that nature. Uh, again, another really gorgeous looking space. I mean, you know, all that natural light coming in, all that glass, all that natural wood around it, that just seems like that would be sort of the ideal space to work within. So what's happening in the rest of the country? This is my last slide. We have mass timber going up everywhere. It's not just here in Texas. As a matter of fact, uh, you go up to the Pacific Northwest and you see these huge pie pieces with all these pies in there. This is where it really exploded within the United States and it's spread down the West Coast and it's spread across the country. And we're seeing these projects all over the place. Uh, so it, it doesn't, it's not something that is niche. It's not something that is uh, really only in certain parts of the country. Uh, like I said, we've got European CLT coming across the ocean uh, supplying projects all across the United States. Uh, so, you know, our, our goal obviously is to look at domestic manufacturing uh, because it's generating revenue for us, it's providing jobs for us, 
Uh, and it's also obviously a lot more sustainable in the fact that we're not putting it on a, a boat and then on a rail or trucks and driving it across the country. That's the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do. Uh, but this is our latest numbers as of September of 2021. Uh, and these numbers just keep going up every time we keep track of them. So it's really impressive. So with that, I am all done. I know we're going to have questions later, so I will pass it back to Mark. Thank you. Give me just a moment here. All right, so our, our final speaker will be uh, uh, James Michael Tate, uh, Professor Tate, uh, is an architectural designer who practices under the name uh, T8 Projects. Um, he's an assistant professor of architecture at Texas A&M University. Um, through the production of design projects and scholarship, uh, Tate contributes to the areas of affordable housing, visual communication, architectural analysis, material culture, and particip participatory urbanism. At a and Tate advances theories of design and makes them impactful as applied research. He contributes design expertise to public agencies, industry partners, and local communities uh, who are tackling challenges that have spatial consequences in the Texas Triangle mega region. So um, uh, Tate will tell you about the, uh, the work he's doing now uh, and as well as, as some of his background and history. So uh, I'll let him tell you about that. He gets the surprises, so yeah. <laughs> anyway, he's been a friend for a long time. And I'm really happy to have him. Does that sound good? Uh, thanks, Mark. And I just want to first say thanks to the CRS Center for uh, helping to organize this event today. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm just going to jump right. <laughs> uh, so we're going to start uh, in 2010. Uh, I was first trying to venture off on my own uh, in the, the, the Great Recession of 2008. And I actually had a couple in Connecticut uh, who had spent uh, their summer in, in Scandinavia and had seen uh, several uh, mass timber cross laminated timber projects and uh, during that travel time. And uh, they invited me to uh, design a, a house for them uh, outside of New Haven. Uh, but the demand was that it had to be made out of CLT. I had heard of CLT in, uh, while I was in my graduate studies, but had never seen it. Uh, and uh, the project was never realized uh, in large part uh, to Mark's uh, speaking about the fact that it, at that time, really the only place that you could get CLT was Austria. And by the time that we talked about the uh, about the amount of embedded energy that it would take to ship those panels from Austria to the United States, uh, it seemed like the most unsustainable thing to do. Uh, a few years later, uh, I was actually contacted by a couple uh, outside of Fredericksburg, Texas, uh, no connection to the bank uh, project that, that was uh, designed by Gensler, but I have a feel, a suspicion that, uh, that the couple may have uh, been aware of that happening. And I gave it a second attempt uh, with this house. And so you can start to see the, the use of kind of panelized CLT. We wanted to, at, uh, as much as possible, uh, use the 
the profile cuts of it and uh, as few panels as possible. At that point, we could potentially get panels from Canada, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, this project also wasn't realized uh, in large part because CLT wasn't available in Texas or uh, even Alabama at that time. So I, I want to set up a little bit of uh, context about just situating the current work uh, in relation to a bit of, of thinking about uh, kind of design process and approach. Uh, when I was uh, a third year student uh, here at Texas A&M and had the option to do the study away program uh, or internship, I decided to do the internship. Uh, and that's when I spent a year at the Auburn University Rural Studio uh, with Sam Mosby. And, uh, and I'm excited this semester that we also have uh, two of the, my teammates that worked on this project will be our last lecturer uh, this semester, uh, Keith and Marie Zalaskowski of on-site architecture. And so uh, you're gonna get to see a bit of, of their trajectory from, for all of us, this is the first project that any of us had uh, worked on uh, design and, and construction of. And if, uh, and if you look at, at Lily uh, over there on your right, you'll notice that those walls are uh, kind of quite made of a strange material, right? No one's ever seen a, a wall, uh, an exterior wall like that. We had partnered with Interface Carpet, the largest uh, carpet manufacturer. Uh, anytime that you see carpet tile, chances are pretty good that it's made from Interface Carpet. And uh, and in that project, we came to realize that uh, I, I wasn't aware of this as, as an architecture student, but just how <laughs> environmentally negative impact uh, the making of carpet is and what in the world do you do with it when it's done? Well, Interface tends to lease their carpet tiles out and in Western Georgia, they have entire warehouses that just have stockpiles of pallets of carpet tiles. And they gave us basically $30,000 and they said, we'll truck over as many of those used carpet tiles as you want uh, to build a house out of. And so we developed what you can see on the right, a kind of experimental system that we called carpet bricks. Uh, which was in many ways, we were looking at things like hay bale construction, uh, uh, rammed earth, all, all of those things were, were influences. And basically we knew that in order to pull off that project, uh, we had to invent uh, a building system. And I would just point out, even though the walls are, are made of carpet, uh, plywood was our dear friend in this because our ability to actually, when inserting windows into it, uh, plywood we found in our tests was the most uh, kind of able to receive uh, the, the, the windows. And that project also was, was awesome. And you can see Keith, that, that's actually Keith and that's Marie who will be here. Uh, that's us uh, building what, Sam Moxby called, uh, referred to in this project as the whacked out piece. And uh, this was the first time that, you know, I mean, being an architecture student, designing lots of kind of uh, weird geometric uh, volumes and masses, you know, we couldn't make this, uh, this part of the house uh, out of steel or, or concrete. Wood was actually the ability to manipulate wood was uh, really worked in our favor in order to, to make the kind of joinery that you're seeing uh, there and the kind of strapping between the, the pieces. Uh, on a completely other side of material experimentation, uh, in, when I was working at, uh, for Michael Meredith and Hillary Sample, we entered a competition called Flip a Strip, uh, which was about ways of utilizing uh, underused parts of parking lots and strip malls. And so in that project, uh, we decided to uh, 
look at the possibility of algae as a material and a kind of biofuel uh, producer. And so why I point this out to you is a lot of the way that you work as a designer, oftentimes when you start with a material that you don't necessarily know how it fits into conventional application, oftentimes the thing that you bring to the table as the designer is the ability to imagine the possibility of what its, uh, its performative, its aesthetics, its assemblies, all of those things can be. Getting back to wood for a second, when I moved to Los Angeles, I did a series of collaborations with the artist Liz Glenn. And Liz came to me, uh, she was aware that I'd worked on, on the carpet house and in a very similar vein, she said, hey Tate, uh, over in East LA, they've told me that I can have as many pallets as I want. In our kind of production system, there are certain uh, material products that just we have a, an abundance of and people are all too happy to give you as much of their waste as possible. And so uh, this was a structure that we designed and collectively uh, built on a hillside in East LA, which uh, was a, 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 a pallet pyramid. Uh, uh, and so it was a kind of temporary structure. Uh, very, there are no fasteners used in this. It's just using the terracing uh, of it. And of course it is a, it is a temporary structure, uh, but, uh, and you can see a little bit of the, there's a kind of light frame that helps us to kind of keep it even as we stack up. Uh, that found me in LA doing a number of kind of weird material experimental projects. Uh, this one we called Fluids Mashup, which uh, we rented a house in Palm Springs. And uh, I wanna focus the attention primarily on what you're seeing as the column on the right, which is actually made out of ice. And so the idea that, uh, that you're actually building a structure that as it is actually being assembled, it's simultaneously collapsing on itself. And so, uh, you know, these kind of weird experiments, and so you, know, you can see me <laughs> hoisting them up and putting them in place. And on the right, you see the structure actually beginning to kind of melt and undermine itself as it's going up uh, until uh, finally you get, uh, until we reached kind of the max that we could build it out. And then these weird moments where it starts to become the leaning tower of, of ice, and then it's kind of total collapse, right? And so, again, I just, I, I point these things out and I know we're, we're focused on wood today, but in general, the role that, that uh, material experimentation in one's uh, process as a, as a designer plays, you know, I think that uh, the things that I do today I, I love the fact that these kind of weird kind of outlying experiments participate in, in that body of work. So now I want to talk a little bit about uh, offsite fat manufacturing and digital fabrication. The first time that, uh, that I had the opportunity to work on a, on a wooden structure uh, that was uh, completely uh, made using CNC routers was uh, in 2002, 2003, uh, I organized something called the First Step Housing uh, Competition in, in New York. And uh, we were given this great uh, kind of Beaux-Arts ballroom space that had kind of gone through all of its kind of life and was in that, that state that you see it. And the exhibition, uh, we weren't allowed to fasten anything to any of the structure itself. So the whole thing had to be inserted in and assembled without any fasteners, uh, without anything. And the housing competition itself actually also asked participants to understand that whatever their proposals were going to be, those things needed to be manufactured offsite and brought in and, and inserted into existing buildings. 
And so uh, through a, a kind of slot and tab system, uh, we've got a bunch of, of Baltic birch, birch plywood. And this is before CNC mills were kind of a part of every architecture school. And so none of us really knew even what we were, we knew that we were making uh, digital files that were being sent off uh, to a CNC mill that was gonna route them. They were gonna come to us kind of flat stack sheets and then we had to sort through them and assemble the parts. Uh, and I just wanna say this is before I went to grad school and I see him in the audience here. Valley Miranda, when I was a sophomore here, uh, we uh, kind of forced us to step away from using the main line and said, hey, start using uh, this CAD program, start using the 3D modeling program. I think it would have been 3D Studio Viz at that time, something like that. It was one. But uh, my understanding of those digital processes at that time allowed for me to understand how to put something like this together. It, it, it wasn't, even, even though I couldn't go out and find uh, examples of slot and tab plywood uh, assemblies, uh, there were certain things in those workflows that uh, were really critical. Uh, in that. And so this uh, exhibition, uh, we had, I think, something like 200 entries. And I'm showing you here uh, the, the winning entries. And it, and it was funny, I, I, I haven't looked at these in quite a long time. But you can see that the, the ones that, we, that were selected to move forward, in many ways, were also wrestling with this idea that uh, the use of, of of plywood, right, as a, as a material and the ability to manipulate it, the ability to use digital fabrication systems to assemble it, uh, those, were, those were beginning to really make their way into uh, the conversation. And even this really kind of, uh, unfortunately, this, was, this one was never realized on the left, but this is a group out at uh, Vancouver. They're called uh, Molo now, Stephanie Forsyth and Todd McAllen. But they were beginning to work with experimental paper structures that could completely collapse and then could be uh, brought out. And so uh, I say this because we like to think about wood sometimes in very conventional ways, but the diversity of wood products that exist out there, uh, there's so many different things that we can do with it. So at the end of the day, these are the these are some some shots of, of the what was eventually uh, used at the Andrews uh, in New York City in the Bowery. And I just want to point out, uh, this is maybe to certain ideas about code and uh, what kinds of housing are encouraged and not encouraged. We were, uh, the city of New York at the time that we were working on this project said, absolutely, you cannot create short-term prefabricated housing uh, in New York City. That's just a recipe for disaster. Uh, this project represents now today an extremely uh, valuable approach to short-term transitional housing in New York City. And it could not have been done without the offsite manufacturing uh, of, of, uh, of kind of two layer plywood uh, 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 units. Uh, I'm gonna switch here uh, to, unfortunately, Aaron's gonna be disappointed in me, but I'm gonna talk about a steel structure right now that was never realized, uh, except for as a mock-up in part. Uh, when I was working with Hillary and uh, Sample and Michael Meredith, uh, one of the main projects I worked on was the uh, Ballroom Marfa Drive-In Theater. And at this point, this was the largest st structure that I had ever worked on. 
in terms of its size and the sheer number of parts that needed to go into it. And so when we're thinking about mass timber or any kind of offsite manufacturing, how parts, how those part to whole relationships and how you understand those assemblies and those tolerances are extremely important. Um, and so you can actually see here on your right, the kind of kit of parts that we needed in order to uh, assemble what was going to become the, the band shell uh, and, uh, and movie projector screen. And they're color coded in terms of, kind of repeating parts. Uh, every part was going to, in the water jetting process, uh, get a little kind of number on it. And so in, a, in its assembly, when it would arrive to Marfa, there was a there was a way in which it could be uh, put together uh, in an efficient way. Uh, the uh, the economic collapse in two thousand eight totally uh, stopped this project from moving forward. But we were able to before that realize uh, this kind of partial mock up. And so I, I promised Aaron I would include this in here. Uh, it's a, that's a very young skinny Tate. <laughs> uh, but before we could actually, before the, the fabricators would even consider making that mock-up, they said, we want you to build a one inch equals a foot model of, the, of, of, of it. And so you can see here, uh, uh, plywood kind of, was the kind of thin air, air, uh, airplane plywood was a good uh, uh, step in uh, substitute for testing out at model scale what this thing would have been at full scale. And so, uh, you know, those are things that I would say in, in, in practice and in time, I've learned that, that those kinds of dialogues back and forth are really critical. The, the largest project that I've ever worked on that used offsite manufacturing prefabrication is actually uh, is a wood project. Uh, when I was at Michael Malton Architecture, the, the primary project I worked on while I was there was uh, was the Star Apartments, and it's uh, the building that you see down at the bottom. Uh, the city of Los Angeles had all but said you cannot make uh, prefabricated uh, housing in this city anymore, and in, in large part because of certain things that uh, responses that grew out of the 60s, 70s uh, that were negative understandings of prefabrication. This project is it's permanent supportive housing for formerly homeless veterans, and there is absolutely no way without the units being made. Uh, being factory built. They were factory built in Idaho at, at Durden's modular building. There is no way that this project could have been realized uh, without that. And so uh, we had to draw every single component. I mean, BIM, BIM was starting to become a, a, a more normative thing in, in, uh, in architectural offices, but this is the first time that that you know, when, when those units went to Gurdon, our tolerances had to be really uh, within like eighths of an inch. <laughs> and uh, here you can see them being, the units being made in Idaho uh, by Gurdon. And then they were eventually shipped to Los Angeles where uh, uh, I had the, I can no longer find this video. I have to find it. But I, one of my main jobs was understanding exactly in what order do you stack these units and where do they go and what place and what position. And I would say that even though this is not using CLT, not using uh, things that we've talked about a bit today, my understanding of how mass timber system structures go together I owe so much to this project and, and that experience. And they, you know, they eventually, there's the model of the building, physical models. We built hundreds of physical models, testing out 
like the different stackings of the unit. And you can see it's a corner site. So we had the ability to locate the crane in a good place. But I promise you, when you're trying to get a unit all the way deep into the other closed sides, those were really kind of difficult things. And so standing there today, uh, and you know, there's a lot of other things I could talk about with this project, but standing on, on the corner in the kind of heart of Skid Row in Los Angeles, the most intense, uh, this is one of the most intense intersections of, of concentrations of uh, homeless individuals in the, in the country is, is this really kind of incredible uh, example of permanent supportive housing. Uh, I, when I left Michael Malton's office, I was awarded the Oberdick Fellowship at uh, the University of Michigan. And part of your obligation as the Oberdick Fellow there is to uh, push the limits of their fabrication facility uh, to do things that, that uh, really hadn't been done yet. And so uh, the project that I took on for that year, we call it some views of triumphal arches. Triumphal arches were really kind of a, a stand-in artifact for the experiments that we were going to work on. And so we actually, uh, using two KUKA robots and uh, a series of kind of turntables that were built uh, I have to I have to give a lot of credit to uh, Tahim and then Asa Peller, who you're seeing there. I think these are both videos. Uh, uh, the middle one and the one on the yeah. right. And then I think the other one on the right is also a video. But these kind of multi-axis uh, cutting of material in multiple directions was something that really hadn't been done at, at the University of Michigan yet. Of course, we did it out of foam because it was cheap, lightweight, and, and whatnot. But you can imagine that uh, how from our 3D model to get the KUKA robots to coordinate them and to get them to understand uh, how to how to cut them Ooh. took lots of lots of trial and error, <laughs> uh, and so but ultimately uh, we were able to make three D chunks of pieces of blocks, uh, cut multi axes, and assemble them within tolerances of of I mean I think we were working within like. 32nd of an inch in, in building this, uh, this structure. So I know I haven't talked about wood for a second, but when did wood start to come back into uh, my life? Uh, when I was uh, adjuncting at UC Berkeley before coming uh, to a and uh, that summer, uh, the first summer that we lived there was when the Santa Rosa fire, uh, you know, one afternoon looked like that. The next morning, uh, when the sun came up, you know, uh, I mean, I get chills just thinking about the fact that all of these people uh, were completely displaced from their housing. And these are the people who, if, if you ever enjoy a glass of, of wine from California, the people who are living in these neighborhoods are the people who work in those places. And, uh, and so I started teaching uh, a series of studios that were looking at the rebuilding process. And this was the first set of studios I taught where we said, you know, we should look into what uh, this cross laminated timber thing might be, <laughs> right? I, I, I had had several failed attempts at it not being realized because uh, Canada was too far to the north and Austria was way too far away. But in the Bay Area, Vancouver was not that far away. And so we did a series of studios where we were beginning to look at, again, uh, the application of cross-laminated timber uh, 
at the scale of, let's say, intermediate uh, two family, three family housing. Uh, that project didn't really uh, go to go forward there because uh, you guys brought me here. Um, and so, but I, 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 w I am happy to say that several of the people that I was working with there continue to motivate that project. But, uh, you know, I, I have to think, uh, I have to thank John Cooper uh, here at Texas A&M, who uh, I think it was my second semester here somehow got word of things I had worked on in the past, uh, had been in conversation uh, with Texas A&M Forest Service, uh, with Brant Cobb, who's in the room here, and started to make uh, partnerships form uh, of, between us. And, you know, I, I put these two maps of Texas here because uh, as, as we've heard, uh, all too well today, this Texas Triangle mega region, uh, what's going to happen here and knowing uh, what resources are available to us in East Texas, it, it's, a, it's a pretty like direct way to say to something, something makes sense about this. Um, and so, uh, I had the good fortune to start teaching a series of 206 studios uh, a few years ago um, in, in spring of 2020. And he said, let's start making this happen. Unfortunately, the pandemic uh, has affected uh, our, our, our process in this to some degree, but I'm gonna show you right now just a couple of slides of, uh, you know, I have to say, in, in spring of 2020, and uh, Aaron, you, you remember this, every day coming into this studio environment on the fourth floor was awesome. There, there were big models being made, just experimenting. How in the world do we begin to work with Texas uh, CLT in order to begin to think about addressing uh, housing questions? And you can see some examples here. These are some good examples of thinking about uh, the assembly of models and the flat packing. Uh, and you know, we've continued that on last year in 206. Uh, again, also simultaneously thinking about not just at the building scale, but what does it mean at the, at the scalar kind of multiplication of these. Uh, and in some of the seminars that I've taught where uh, this was a this was a fun uh, kind of speculative project where we use the kind of CLT meaning community land trust and CLT meaning cross laminated timber to begin to look at models of uh, economic revitalization in East Texas if uh, if CLT manufacturing uh, were to come in into play uh, and then even in some graduate studios. Uh, continuing to, to work uh, on this. Uh, we used, uh, this, this happened right at the, uh, the end of, right, right as the pandemic, this, this exhibition opened literally March, 2020 uh, at the Ohio State University where I was invited to uh, think about, every participant was given one priority mail uh, uh, shipping box and you had to ship something to the exhibition. So continuing on with this kind of fascination of the flat pack, uh, we're gonna say, okay, well, we're actually gonna, we're gonna pack four CLT houses into our box. And so we kind of assigned a scale to the, to the box, to the, to the uh, mailbox. And then, uh, and then you can see how they arrive uh, uh, flat and then, the process of how it goes from completely packed out to uh, a series of, of, of multi-unit structures. <laughs> uh, and so cardboard models were helpful uh, in that process too. Uh, as, as many of you know, uh, there are exciting things uh, that are happening 
with housing uh, directly in Lufkin uh, that are neighbors to where some of these, uh, these potential cloth laminated timber uh, manufacturers are, are coming into place. And so I've been fortunate for the last few years to be developing a relationship with the nonprofit Impact Lufkin. And I mean, I'm really hopeful that we're gonna be able to uh, use some of the first Texas DLT to build some housing there. Uh, and then just to kind of end, if, if you go down under the bridge, you can see and experience this thing full scale one-to-one. -one. Uh, I have to thank uh, Mr. Brent Cobb back there because he called up one day this past summer and said, hey, I've got some CLT panels on a trailer. Uh, can I bring them over and drop them off? Like maybe I should have asked more permission for certain things, but I said, you bet, come on over. <laughs> um, and so we knew that, uh, and so uh, here, here's that flatbed trailer pulling up out at the Rellis campus. We had no idea really what was showing up, but we were, we were determined to make something happen with it. And, uh, and so in preparation for the Texas Forestry Association annual meeting. And so the panels that showed up, first and foremost, they were, they were too big for our, our equipment to actually mill. So one of the first things that we had to do was trim them down so that, uh, so that they could actually uh, we could even get them inside and even think about them on the CNC mill. Uh, we had to do weird stuff that don't tell anybody. Don't tell OSHA. But we had to, I'm not even going to show you the whole thing, but uh, we had to do certain things in terms of like figuring out how in the world do you flip these panels. But eventually we got them into a series of, yeah, Valley, Valley just don't close your eyes. But we eventually got them uh, to a size that we could uh, manageably like move them around and work with them, put them on our, our three axis mill. Uh, and I mean, we pushed the hell out of that thing. Uh, this, was, this is the older mill that we have. And, uh, you know, we were, this thing was screaming as we were, were cutting on it. And so you can see, I mean, before anything, we had to kind of uh, do an initial rough path to kind of knock it down to make it at, at as flat as possible. You can see us cutting the Texas table here, thinking about kind of joinery notches of how to, to splice one panel to another. Uh, I think that's the video. I mean, it was loud. But I point that out because, I mean, that's solid wood that you're cutting through, right? It's one thing when, I'm, when, when you're CNCing through uh, styrofoam or whatever, but this stuff is, it's solid material, right? And so we're, we were sitting there pushing it. Fortunately, uh, Dave out at, out at the ranch was able to get uh, the other CNC machine up and running for us. And this thing was cutting through that southern yellow pine like butter. And, uh, and so we were able to do that. There were things that we had no idea what they were gonna produce, but I knew that I really loved the fact that CLT was an additive material, meaning you, know, you get one row and then, you, and then you cross laminate and then another. So it's an additive process that puts it together. Uh, and so what, it, what does it actually mean to then begin to carve back out of it after it's been assembled. So additive and subtractive processes. Uh, I love the fact that like leaving certain parts that maintain the natural kind of wood grain, but others doing these, these patterns that make it look pixelated. So beginning to kind of, again, think about it on multiple registers, aesthetic, assembly, uh, you know, performance issues, uh, and then you know, just the joy of uh, students who, like we've been talking about this stuff for uh, two or three years, but uh, by and large, no one has actually seen it before or, or 
or touched it or, or felt the weight of it. And so, you know, just these processes of, of at the end of last summer, kind of working with it, finishing it, uh, thinking through that. And then uh, the image on your right is from yesterday and the image on your left is from when we assembled it out in the forest uh, in East Texas at the Texas a and Forest Service space. But, you know, I, I would venture to say that if we were talking about this being a masonry or uh, steel component, there's no way that even uh, four, five heavy lifters could actually lift it and put it into place. So even though this thing is still heavy, and sure, we can talk about any number of ways that of, of how moving forward, like where even kind of light equipment could be used. This thing is, is assembled in about 10 minutes uh, using humans uh, and the kind of interlocking pieces without any fasteners. And please don't go run and charge at it, but I promise you, you could run into this thing and it's not going anywhere. But when we start to think about things like disaster recovery housing, uh, man, this stuff could be already ready to go. And we're talking about the ability to do resilient housing like out of the gate. Uh, not if a, if a hurricane hits Rockport or uh, Galveston or the coast again, but when, right? And so this is, a, this is an example of, of, uh, of, an, of a prototype, a kind of construct system of, of how that could begin to be thought of and, and go together. Uh, and then just a couple of kind of detail shots. Again, really, I mean, to me uh, on certain levels, like these kind of fun surface level things to play with, just the idea that, that beginning to think about the depth and the thickness of, of, of the material, we think about different kinds of in masonry rustication or smooth stone, different finishes. You know, this begins to also talk about that possibility uh, for CLT as well. And I mean, I, I have to close out by saying none of this would have been possible uh, to date without uh, someone who's become a real buddy and friend, uh, Aaron Stottlemyre. And it, and it speaks to more than anything, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm an architectural designer. There are certain moments in the, in the material and building product side that where I enter in and I have a, a level of expertise and understanding and bring things to the table. But guess what? I don't have knowledge and expertise about uh, forestry economics and all of that. I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm spitting out my imaginative ideas about that stuff. And uh, the collaboration with, with Aaron over the last uh, two years uh, has been uh, absolutely an enjoyable experience. And so uh, with that, the last image I will end with is, uh, is this. This is, a, this is a drawing we made my first summer uh, here uh, at, at a and m And you can see just the, the messiness of the design process, right? And uh, we, we don't have right and wrong answers, but like as designers, the culture of studio, the culture of making things, testing them out, breaking them, redoing them, iterating them, bringing them into the computer, bringing them in out of the computer, all of those things, that's how innovation like happens here. And so uh, please, I, I know it's hard to uh, right now to think about working in studio, but the exchanges that happen among those guests uh, is absolutely crucial to the advancement of our field. So thank you guys. Step in this, our final step in this will be we'll just bring the speakers up.
and and do a panel up here. So um, so um, if y'all can come up and and Brant, you're invited to. So you know, since you put up the material for the for the structure, you get some rights. And he brought some material so you guys can see it. So. You know, so this is a question and answer session. And, you know, if you're in my class and you ask a question, you get an A for participation. So, you, know, <laughs> you ask a good question, you know, so. Um, so, um, um, you know, I just kind of want to open it up to that. But do you all have questions for each other first? So having seen what can, each can other's I, doing. I, I want to point out one thing about the, the Texas examples that we saw in, in Mark's presentation. First, uh, the Soto building in San Antonio, the general contracting office for that is Byrne Construction, Texas A&M Construction Science major. Uh, yeah, if if, if y'all could make sure you use the mics and make sure the mic is on, check that. Yep. Okay. So I was just saying that uh, the Soto in San Antonio, and if you ever find yourself in San Antonio, and I, uh, you know, it's in a great, uh, really exciting neighborhood that a lot of stuff is starting to happen over there. Uh, I was just saying that the general contractor uh, for that project is Burn Construction, which, uh, uh, you know, Texas A&M, Deep Ties, uh, Construction Science, Tony Battle, and then uh, the Magdalena uh, Lake Flato project, Sophia Rub uh, not, uh, uh, Razuk, uh, Sophia uh, Razuk is at Lake Flato. Uh, was very much involved in that project and at San Jacinto College uh, uh, at uh, Kirksey Architects, Texas A&M uh, Architecture. So uh, we may not have a building uh, made of mass timber on this campus yet, and we, sh we should fight like hell to make it happen. Uh, but Texas A&M uh, in construction science and architecture uh, are working on these projects. Hope that my students who are here really, you know, kind of um, learned a lot from that as well. I have a couple of questions. I'll start with Aaron, maybe. Aaron, um, it was interesting that you showed the house, the historic house in Rockport with the mass timber. Um, so I work in preservation and in the preservation world, we really kind of talk a lot about old growth wood versus new growth wood. So I was wondering with the Southern yellow pine, how has it changed in Texas and the way it was, it used to be versus what it is now? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, and interestingly, um, but, uh, but not surprisingly, you know, um, when early settlers came to, came to the United States, they were encountering large trees that they, they, they had the opportunity to, to harvest. And, and after that, um, <clears throat> it's been, you know, interestingly, the the concept of forestry, forestry as a discipline is only about a hundred years old. Um, and once we figured out how to do production forestry, um, and I'm talking primarily pine silviculture in the, in the Southern United States, you know, depending on where you are in the world and what grows there, you know, there's gonna be a different, a, a very different suite of, of management practices that are needed to uh, produce uh, the largest amount of timber uh, on in, in a in, in the least amount of time, um, while also ensuring that you're getting all the other benefits that forests have to offer. Right, forests are, are unique among systems where agricultural commodities are produced in that yes, you're getting timber, but they also provide clean water and wildlife habitat and recreational opportunities and carbon sequestration. There's no other system that produces a, a, an agricultural commodity that, that, that offers those and many other benefits that I, that I didn't mention. And so since uh, kind of the, the, the inception of forestry in the United States, which hasn't been that, that awful long, um, 
you know, we no longer grow trees to be the size of what early settlers uh, encountered when they first when they first came to the, this country and settled different areas of, of the United States. Uh, and so, in in when you, in managing pines, uh, our technology has advanced to the point where we can we can actually harvest what used to be trees that would only be used for making paper. We figured out how to, to use them. Well, we can, even if mills, uh, and Brent, you might have some comments about this. I'll do the best I can, but, but, but this is the manufacturer on, on the panel. Uh, we figured out how to, to be able to take a relatively small diameter pine log, and we might only be able to get a, a, a couple of two by fours out of them, uh, but we're not wasting the other parts either. You know, the, the slabs that, that, that we take off of that tree might go for chips. Um, the bark uh, and the sawdust aren't, aren't wasted either. Um, interestingly, many of the mills, the, the high production mills in the South uh, have both a minimum size and a maximum size. And after the housing collapse of 2008, many of our landowners took their their trees off of the market because they weren't, they knew they weren't gonna be able to get top dollar for their trees. Well, those trees got bigger and bigger. And so now once we, once housing came back, um, like, like it did, many of those trees outgrew the capacity of, of sawmills to actually be able to harvest them. So it's, 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 it's very interesting, but kind of circling back to your question, um, uh, our, our concept of forestry uh, and production forestry has, has, has really changed since early settlers were harvesting uh, old growth. We really don't do that anymore. We do have some old growth remaining in different parts of the country that we kind of, we, we do preserve. You, you use the, the term preserve and, uh, and that's very different than conserve, right? Uh, conserve so implies use and preserve implies that you're just kind of keeping that system as, as, as a museum, if, if you will. I, I guess my question was more about the fact that it seems like older wood because they allowed the trees to grow over a wider amount of, longer amount of time led to denser growth rings. So that wood was more durable versus newer wood, which it seems like they make it grow more quickly um, to be able to get more value from the land. The wood is not as durable because, and I, you had that image with the growth rings, because I've seen so many of those showing, you know, how older wood was a lot more denser and hence more uh, durable as opposed to newer wood, which tends to deteriorate more rapidly over time. Um, but it seems like, you know, some of which was you were saying was, yes, it may be kind of softer and less durable, but because we figured out ways like cross laminated timber and other things to uh, kind of bond it together, we're able to use it in um, more imaginative uh, ways that, uh, mitigate some of those shortcomings. Yep, and, and I'm, I'm not a, uh, a, a wood expert. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, so my expertise is more in, in, in ecology, but there, there are people that, you know, know wood more, like the anatomical properties. I'm, I guess I should say I'm not a wood properties mm -hmm. um, person, but yes, there are, for different products, there are a, a, a an ideal number of rings per per inch, and uh, and yes, when you when you use lumber in a uh, in a in an engineered wood uh, application, yes, there are an, an ideal number of, of, of rings per inch. But it kind of kind of comes becomes irrelevant when you're taking it all and putting it putting it together right. to make a super strong panel mm -hmm. like, like you're seeing. Mm -hmm. Without boring everybody with a lot of details, I don't know what I'll do better, huh? but. Uh, I actually, use it because we've got a Zoom. Oh, I'm sorry. So they'll pick it up. Um, uh, and, I, and I'm going to address one specific study that I participated in the late 80s. I outdate y'all. Anyway, <laughs> um, and it was it was specifically to address your question about fast growth versus old growth timbers. Mm -hmm. And most of the stress values that were that were part of the building codes back before that were was based on studies that were done in the 50s and 60s. And I can tell you right here unequivocally. When Mississippi State finished that study in the late 80s, the values were actually higher, hmm. not lower in those trust values. Now, they still didn't adjust the trust values. They didn't get the benefit of that. But um, there are issues, and 
particularly when you get into grades like DS65 or DS72 or some of the other grades of lumber where density becomes an issue. Um, but um, at the end of the day, how the material is used, designed, built, maintained mm -hmm. is all the important aspects of how long that project's gonna last. Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, I, I, I wanna add, you know, one of the concerns that we get all the time is that the wood is not a durable material. And in reality, wood, I mean, we have wood structures that are over a thousand years old on this, this planet. The most important thing on preserving a wood structure is the building envelope. Uh, if you have a good building envelope, your wood will last forever. It doesn't really matter whether it's heartwood or it's new growth or whatever the case may be. I, I think that's one of the concerns is that everyone thinks that, you know, wood is oftentimes used in, uh, you know, like low rise apartment buildings that will get torn down after 10 or 15 years of use. And it's not because the building is not structurally sound, it's because the land use has changed. And now that land is more valuable for some other type of property than an apartment building. And I just had a conversation the other day about some really nice apartments in downtown Dallas in the Victory area that are being torn down because now that land is gonna be used for something else. And it's not because the apartments are falling apart. And I think, you know, when you talk about, you know, preserving any structural material, you know, keeping, uh, you know, water and, and deteriorates things mm -hmm. away from it is critically important. And obviously we had an issue in Miami recently that, that exposed some of the weaknesses of, of concrete and, and rebar. Uh, so it's, it's really important to protect the material. And if you don't protect the material, if you don't maintain the material, then just about anything is going to start yeah. to fall apart. Yeah. Absolutely. So I don't want to take up too much time, but building on that, because I did have a question for Mark, because you showed a lot of projects in which all of the cross laminated timber was exposed in those cantilevers. And, you know, um, I mean, it was in the underside, but still there were lots of exposed parts. Um, it seemed like you suggested that Southern yellow pine was not used in those um, uh, locations. It seemed like that was more like cedar or other more durable types of woods. Yeah, well, it's, it's one of the issues of, you know, Southern yellow pine, if you do preservative treatments to it, it will last fine, but that tends to be a less attractive look uh, or, you know, the, the material just doesn't, you know, look the way that the rest of the material on the, on the project looks. So uh, there are certain instances when selecting a different species of wood makes more sense if it's exposed to direct weather continuously. If it's in a soffit application where it's not gonna see direct exposure to rain and direct exposure to UV, then any of these materials should be fine with, with, I would say, regular routine maintenance, nothing extraordinary. But if you are gonna have something that's gonna come down and potentially make contact with the ground, that detailing of how that, that column hits the ground is critical that you don't get water pooling underneath it. Uh, we have to very critically protect any of the end grain because that's gonna be where a lot of the water is gonna be absorbed into it. Uh, and you know the fear with a lot of applications is that if, if a building gets built with CLT and then it changes hands, the new owner may not understand the maintenance that the, the old owner might have said. You know, the, the higher education projects, you know, they're going to maintain those buildings forever because they're going to keep them on their campus and it's worked in the same ownership group. So, I mean, there are concerns with it, but it's one of those things where it's not uh, anything that's going to be, uh, I, I, I wouldn't describe any tragedies occurring with it. You know, another thing obviously that happens with wood is that it's very easy to see when the wood starts to uh, lose any of its you know, structural properties, you can physically push it with your fingers, things of that nature. Whereas it's, it won't be hidden uh, unless obviously it's covered up with drywall or something of that nature. So if it's mm -hmm. exposed, then you'll be able to see it and, and understand where, mm -hmm. how well it's performing. So the CLT products we saw, they were all, they're always made of pine or are they made of different? Well, I mean, it, that's the challenge right now is that we have, we have CLT coming from Europe. We have it coming from Canada. So a large majority of the Canadian CLT from the western side of Canada is going to be uh, spruce pine fir or dug fir. Uh, if it's from the eastern side, which is really one specific manufacturer, it's uh, the uh, just drawing a complete blank. Where? Nordic. Nordic. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, what's the species? Uh, Black spruce, thank you, black spruce, which is very white wood, which is ironic, they call it black spruce. Uh, and then you've got different species over in Europe as well. Uh, so we have a mixture of CLT products within Texas. Uh, you know, some of them are Southern yellow pine, but probably the majority of them are not at this point, simply because those Canadian and Pacific Northwest plants have been around longer, so. Yeah, we, we currently only have a, um, we're, we're about to have 
well, we have uh, three, uh, three manufacturers that have PRG320 certification. Um, Brands one of them, uh, and then there are two other, uh, two other manufacturers. Uh, of the three, uh, only one is producing structural panels um, at, at scale. Um, uh, that's about to become two uh, with the addition of, of structural lamb in, in Conway, Arkansas. The other one is used to be IBX lamb in Dothan, Alabama. Uh, they're now small part lamb. So, I mean, you know, th so there aren't, you know, the availability is an issue. Uh, and when you have uh, low supply, you don't have competitive pricing. And so, you know, so, so, so cost is somewhat of an issue when, it, when those jobs go out to bid. Uh, 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 thank you very much uh, for Mark to put this together and for Mark, Aaron, Brent and Tate as well, enjoyed the presentation. My question is, uh, is based on Bria's last comment uh, and, and your, your answer, Mark, about the look of the SYP or the silver and yellow plant. Because I think, I wanna point this out for our students too, that the, 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 the fundamental challenge of the Southern Yellow Pine is its look and its color. And uh, most of the project that you know you see in a presentation like this of mass timber is all non-Southern Yellow Pine, right? It's white pine, because uh, really the look of the Southern Yellow Pine is not favorable for clients and projects to expose it. So I, I think it's about maybe time, it's a time to reposition how can we deal with that challenge, right? Of the color and the, <laughs> the, the grain of the Southern Yellow Pine that you probably, most architects and, pro, and uh, clients would not like for it to be exposed. What's being done about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, as part of- uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, but I love protection. To uh, mention it, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity, you know, for all these east uh, towns in Lufkin and East Texas to grow, you know, and, and have the presses and everything. But how would you compete in that market uh, when you cannot expose that product? You know, are you just thinking about it as a, you know, structural materials going to be cladded uh, uh, and hidden? If so, right, you know, uh, I think that the message needs to be focused on that. You, you see what I'm saying? So as, as part of um, our initiatives, trying to promote awareness and acceptance of, of, of mass timber, but specifically Southern Yellow Pine cross laminated timber in our agency. Uh, I've spent a lot of time going across the state and, and talking with many of the influencers, many of the, the people who, um, had a, a, a key role in, in realizing those various projects, a couple of which uh, are, are now uh, utilizing Southern Yellow Pine, uh, Blue Lamb, and, and, and Cross Laminated Timber. And we're, we're very interested in, in their motivation and their, and their experience. And, and we asked all of them questions, um, you, you know, about that and, and, and I'm going to have to, to disagree with this, this idea that, that, that the appearance is a major issue. We're, we're not hearing that uh, from, these, from these influencers. In fact, when we have uh, comments from, from various individuals who uh, in fairly large firms uh, that, that you know, have offices all across the country, um, that there's actually... That, that, that that appearance is is desirable um, in that for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, you know, when you uh, when you live in a in a place or in a, in a region, there's a familiarity with the type of wood that grows in the region in which you live. So, in other words, um, to to be in the South, uh, to be uh, behind the pine curtain, uh, there's a familiarity. With, with, with Southern yellow pine and, and to be in a space with exposed wood, um, be it spruce or pine or fir is just unfamiliar. 
the, the folks that we talk to uh, across the, the South um, that, are, that are designing buildings and that have the option, and really the, the availability of some of those other species is, is greater at, at this point with, with such, with so little cross laminated timber being produced with only, really only a single manufacturer producing uh, uh, at, at this point. They talk about uh, the movement in, in the wood and the warmth uh, of the wood when you can actually, you see the, the grain of the Southern yellow pine as, as opposed to spruce pine and fir. So, so um, we hear that, we hear that a lot. And, and we specifically ask questions for all those that we interviewed as, as part of our, uh, our, our, our video series that we're producing. And, and, and honestly, we're, we're just not hearing that from, from influencers who are designing with these materials. Okay, um, I'm the Southern Yellow Pine guy. Okay, I sell I sell Douglas fir, I sell Western Red Cedar, I sell Cypress, I sell every species of wood that y'all can imagine. There's not a species of wood the other other wood. Now they're they're frowning at me because I'm going to disagree with something really really quick. You can go. How many of y'all been to uh, Kima Boardwalk? Kima Boardwalk. Next time you go to Kima Boardwalk, most of that wood is Southern Yellow Pine, and it's only sealed. It's not even painted. It's only sealed. Is that a horrible looking place? Does everybody turn their back on the wood? No. So this idea of that appearance of Southern Yellow Pine is somehow detracting or different is, is totally out of place. Now I want to talk to something about that's very, very specific also. We pressure treat our CLT panels now. We have bridge builders that are building bridges out of CLT panels that are pressure treated. We're treating them like Southern Yellow Pine plywood. It meets AWPA specs for treatment. And they're going out on jobs, permanent exterior wood bridges. So what does that mean about longevity? What does that mean about longevity? And I know people are smiling at me because if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm incredibly passionate about what we're doing. And they're laughing at me too because they've heard me talk like this before. But I want y'all to come up here and knock on this thing. This is a canvas, and what I am most excited about being here today about is because y'all are the ones that can make a difference in what we're doing, not us. We can talk about it, yeah, and I can tell a good story, but this is a canvas for y'all to build the future on, and I'm not being just hypothetical here. I'm talking about reality. This piece of wood, you know why I brought this one? That's roughly a cubic foot of Southern Yellow Pine. After that project is cut in the woods, harvested, the lumber is made out of it. If you want to pressure treat it, fine, pressure treat it. Whatever you do with it, and you install it, and you put it in a permanent project, guess what? You just permanently sequestered 17 pounds of CO2. If you had done this out of concrete, you had released 20 pounds of CO2 in the atmosphere. If you've done this out of steel, you've released 30 pounds of CO2 out of the atmosphere. You get to choose, not us. This is your future. This is something that we're bringing to the table that you can choose to use or not use, okay? Now I got way off subject about appearance. <laughs> I can make this piece of wood like look like redwood cedar. I can make it look like redwood. I can make it look like cedar. I can make it look like spruce. I can change the color and the texture of this piece of wood to anything you want it to be. And that's where I'll leave it. Sorry, I'm going to address that really, really quick. Also, that's why we have specs. 
That's why this product is not just Texas CLT product. This is an APA certified CLT pattern that has to meet specifications. I'm speaking to the choir. Y'all know all about building codes and specifications and why things have to be done the way they are. Expect, demand, ask, whatever you want to do. The same thing for your building material. If you ask a wood producer to provide you certification, just like you would a steel manufacturer or the cement plant that's providing you the cement, ask them for it, demand it, get it. You will. So what I would say to that is as long as you build within specs and specify the material correctly using AWPA or whatever building codes you're going by, then you expect that product to perform exactly the way you would expect the steel and concrete. And, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, I get real passionate about this, but unfortunately, our industry is to blame for that. The forest products industry has done a pitiful job of educating consumers. Probably, I doubt if many of you know of the various specifications that the individual boards, not let alone the panel, but that board is manufactured to a very specific standard and it carries a stamp on it. Expect it, ask for it. Okay, I'm sorry, I get feeling. <laughs> I, I will add one thing uh, to the, the question about the appearance of Southern Yellow Pine is that I, in almost every single mass timber project that I've consulted with, uh, regardless of what species has been used, there has been some sort of stain applied to it uh, or some sort of finish applied to it because it's never the exact color that the, the design team is looking for. Even black spruce, Doug fir, SBF, they've all typically had some sort of stain or colorization. Uh, I mean, if you hear the story of the Soto project where they, they had samples brought in that were small, but they didn't compare to the big ones and they had to go back in and reformulate the staining that they were using. So it's a, you know, every project is gonna be manipulated in some way due to color. Uh, the other thing that you can do, uh, not that I'm recommending it uh, because it requires a little bit more work is that, you know, some of the manufacturers will put a, a surface lamination of a specific species down and the rest of the mass timber panel can be whatever species of lumber it is and then what's exposed would be whatever they've required for it. Now that would may require material being shipped and, and you know, burning more fuel for that, but it can happen. Right, I'm gonna add something to that because we're doing something specific and I don't know if you're aware of it, Mark, but we're working with uh, Virginia Tech and we will be doing a project next month where we're actually doing that. We're taking popular on the dot, bot, well, no, popular on one side, white oak and the inner layers of Southern Yellow Pine. And they're not, the, the reason they're wanting to do that is to demonstrate the ability to make a panel, just as, as Mark described it there, where you've got different species of wood because the architect on the job wants a different look. So we're, we're doing that next month. Um, and, you know, everything will be out in the open before we do it. Yeah. I'm kind of curious that, you know, other architects in the room, I mean, again, this, the, uh, the, the appearance, it, the apparent appearance issue um, c comes up and, you know, we try our best to kind of put our finger on that and it, Yeah, not, let, let, let's, let's, let's leave that one for now <laughs> because we've got some other things to talk about. So, um, but, uh, but, okay, five seconds. You get it. Well, I, so, so okay, he got he got five seconds. I, I want five seconds. <laughs> so I, I'm going to say, you know, one example: uh, the 120,000 square foot classroom building at San Jacinto College. Uh, you know, the vice chancellor uh, of facilities told me. If Southern Yellow Pine would have been available, that's what that classroom building would have been built out of. And you're talking almost 2,000 tons of, of mass timber. Okay, so we've got a question here. Hello. Um, thank you, Mark, for inviting me to this. I'm from Rockdale. I'm working at a company where 
well, I'm trying to convince my people that CLT is the way to go for an office space. We're also uh, doing large industrial projects, mainly metal buildings, even aluminum frame, tensile membrane structures, very long buildings, um, 800 to 1,000 feet long or more. I'm wondering, um, is CLT mass timber being used for these industrial applications where it may be a low occupancy sort of a space, but the traditional industrial um, spatial qualities such as like a high ceiling, high doors, ventilation are desirable. Um, can CLT mass timber compete with traditional metal buildings in this regard economically? We know it's quick and we've seen buildings like in Fayetteville, that large, uh, the book depository building, you know, spatially it, it fits, but does it work economically? Can I convince my people that we should <laughs> switch to this new industry, help the state of Texas, uh, put these buildings up super quick, but you know we still have to cover these buildings, and that's extra cost. What does that look like? You know, how does that conversation start, and what do you think it finishes up? As? We'll, we'll try uh, to convince them. Um, the, the the big challenge of industrial applications for CLT, and we've seen it in smaller applications. And right now, uh, uh, Kalashnikov, which is a, a Canadian manufacturer, has a industrial project in Dallas that they're using CLT on. And I haven't been involved in the project, so I'm not sure if it's for the walls or if it's just for the roof or if it's for both. Uh, the challenge with, uh, you know, a metal building or tilt wall concrete, which is typically what's used for industrial applications, is that you don't have to do anything to the exterior. Uh, you know, you stand those panels up, you stand those concrete panels up, or you put the, the metal sheeting on and, and it's done, more or less. And with CLT, uh, although it's going to give you better insulating values than, than either of those two materials, you do still have to apply some sort of exterior system to protect it. Um, and so that's been the big cost uh, delta right there is that aspect of it. Um, not to say that we can't overcome that in the future. I think that's gonna be one of those things that we're gonna start to see creep over once we start to see CLT as mainstream in, in construction in general. And, and where we don't even have to have these kind of symposiums to talk about CLT because it's just sort of commonplace that's when we'll start to see it enter into uh, what I would call spec single family homes or uh, other type of industrial applications where you can, you can start to put it together as a kit of parts and it makes it easy, but um, limited in industrial right now. Um, now that being said, for six years, I worked for Simpson Strong Tie in McKinney, Texas in their old facility and they had a warehouse that had gorgeous glue laminated beams uh, and uh, you know, tongue and groove decking for the roof. But then again, it's a wood company. So they might have probably been happy to pay a little bit of a premium for something like that. And if you don't have a, an owner that's on board with uh, potentially paying a premium for that material, if all they're concerned about is the bottom line for an industrial type project, then it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a difficult challenge to overcome. I wanna throw two cents worth in also is uh, we have a customer in Dallas that builds development and he builds commercial buildings and uh, he had built all of his previous ones out of tilt-up concrete he went with the clt panel his remark was when it was talked about the exterior coating he always had to finish the concrete tilt-up walls to please his tenants with color or sealant or something to make it not look like a concrete slab and so the same cost that he had to apply to that concrete tilt of wall was equal to, or and sometimes greater than applying what he applied to the CLT panel. So he went with the CLT panel and he is now like in his fourth or fifth building. And the, the what he also gained is the client acceptance because when they walked into that building and they saw the wood walls, they just fell in love with the place. So, I'm not saying every single case, one is going to be less expensive than the other. But my point is, why not shop it? Why not ask the question? It doesn't hurt. Bottom line, it gives you more options. So I, I was super impressed with the video of the soda where the zip panels are actually applied flat and then tilted up. So the labor that would go into putting the zip panels in on a flat surface and then to, I mean, that, that seems to me to already be starting to think about how that application could be cost savings. So. More that's done, yeah. More you can do in the prefabrication facility, less than needs to be done on job, usually makes it more cost effective. So. 
thank you guys for uh, the presentation. It's beautiful to see people are enjoying what they're doing and they are passionate about uh, what they're doing. But let's be realistic because we have students here. We want them to learn and be uh, realistic about what's happening. We know every material has its limitation. Uh, yes, using concrete and steel is super uh, not sustainable, let's say, uh, in terms of uh, comparing to the wood. Uh, my question would be, and I really liked it, Aaron, when you said, when you break it down to the basic principles, for example, what is wood? When you uh, break down everything to the basic principles, that's where innovation happens. Uh, what do you think, where is the source or where is there more room for making innovation in terms of design? Because as designers, as architects here, we, we care more about the design process. Maybe as a result of a design process, we need another form that we cannot, or we have a limitation in terms of making it with wood. Where do you think is the more room for innovation here? Because again, in this era, we are using digital technologies. We are, as uh, Tate showed us, when you use robots, nowadays architects are using robots to bridge the gap between the design and fabrication. So where do you think this question applies for you guys, which are on the side of technical aspect of it, and also Tate, you, in terms of design, where do you think is more room for innovation for our students here? I think it's uh, so. A, co a couple of thoughts on that. You know, um, right right now there's a just a lot of emphasis on a large commercial building space. Um, you know, Mark. Mark showed the uh, the four types of, of new construction in the 21 uh, IBC. But when you think about where the materials are going, when you think about the, the, the various types of construction, you think about, you know, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you, know, you architects and engineers don't, don't shoot me, but I, I think of them in terms of like, you know, single family, like mid scale, mid scale commercial, and then large buildings and, and there's probably you know various cases various categories of large um, but when you when you talk about where the materials are going and where the uh, where the real opportunities are for uh, for cross laminated timber in particular I think of of mid-scale commercial you know uh, um, um, and and you know maybe multi-family mid-scale multi-family and mid-scale commercial so I think that's a uh, that's a, a key uh, uh, part of a uh, type of construction that there's not a whole lot of thought currently about, um, you know, where design opportunities are. So I think that's a big one. Uh, and then uh, thinking, you know, very much out, outside the box for me as a, as a forester is, is, you know, kind of observing the kinds of things that Tate is thinking about. And that is, you know, not just thinking about the, the flat surface of the wood, but, but thinking about how we can, can use uh, some of these various digital technologies to, uh, to create different aesthetics on an otherwise flat panel uh, is very innovative. Uh, and, and also the connections themselves. Uh, you know, Tate is, is, I think, thinking way beyond his, his contemporaries and how we can use the wood itself to create the connections to where we can get away from some of these uh, proprietary connections and these uh, uh, very, very beautiful steel connections. Uh, when you think about, uh, you know, Tate's primary of, er, area of expertise, and that is housing, how can we use the wood itself to create the connections and the in the construct that that he designed and and, and is actually uh, just 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 downstairs for for all of us to see? Uh, uh, I think is a great example of both both uh, creating using digital technology to create different aesthetics uh, in a you know in a in a material that's both you know laminated and and offers opportunities to actually see the wood in different ways as you as you carve into it um, but also creating different connections uh, or, or oppor design opportunities that, that I think are, are really exciting for, for the students in the room. Yeah, yeah and I, I think it's to expand upon what Mehdi was just describing um, because 
Mark, I, I think, or Aaron, you actually described it as an ecosystem, which I would say expand out as a design ecosystem. You have to know the process in order to innovate and then to truly experiment. And, and I would venture a guess, Tate, even with the previous projects that you showed, which were basically flat packs and tabs and things like that, that didn't provide you with the answer that you were looking for for this particular installation. And in fact, if you just thought about it as a, a kit of parts with the, the aircraft plywood, you wouldn't have got the material detailing that you got because you wanted to experiment. So the nature of using the real materials, so thank you again for donating the material to us to make that happen. That's how we found design, right? And we found opportunities. Because I remember sitting upstairs with you detailing out how these parts and pieces would go together. And we're like, well, what can this thing really do? And when you started experimenting in that way, it totally changed the design solution. So while we may start with form and parts and whole to come together, it's really with experimenting with the real material that gave you the true opportunity to experiment. Now, on the other side, to the expanded ecosystem, uh, Mark, the way that you were describing it, uh, digital fabrication, and really using BIM tools to their fullest potential, right? So, Medi with the robots, you were actually sewing robots uh, with the foam materials and other uh, opportunities. Here, we really need to invent the machine that's really going to operate in the way that we want it to, rather than being limited by the machines and the capabilities of the access routers. So for me, that's really the next step, especially with the scale. And if we don't have a facility that can operate with the panels that you're bringing in, that's a problem, right? So there's an inherent uh, issue that we have. And, and I would go back, why Virginia Tech? We have the same capabilities here. So Brent, we're gonna have to describe this. Yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> we're coming to you. Um, so, uh, but I think that there's a real opportunity for us to challenge conventional norms, use emerging tools and processes to truly innovate and experiment. Now the material, I wholeheartedly agree with you and I share your passion with this opportunity that we have, because as we're looking at uh, the solar decathlon project right now, which we're involved, we're one of two institutions that are uh, in both the design and the build for the solar decathlon 2022 and 2023. We're doing both single family and multifamily and the material that we're using is CLT. So everything that we're driving right now is going for an international platform. And even now, I know we're not experimenting in the level that Tate was, but we don't need that right now. But for the students, I think that the true opportunity here is you're learning invaluable tools to think critically, but we don't know the process. We don't know the moisture content of the wood. We have experts that are in the room that could help us get to that and help us really experiment that much more. So I'm very excited about what this uh, symposium is doing for us and as a department of architecture that is intrinsically involved with the people that are at the table, this is our future, right? And you all, as was mentioned, you know, challenge conventional norms and move forward. I'm excited. CNC machine can do absolutely wonderful things for these panels. They do all kinds of cutouts and all kinds of connections. And so the imagination is, is where it's at. Okay. Okay. Uh, I've got another question. Well, many questions, but uh, I won't ask about properties. That's boring. What is the battle of convincing a city that has not adopted the new IBC look like? <laughs> You know, do we have to show proof of example? Any of you guys like, want to take hey, that one? Political. There's a bunch of concrete people out there <laughs> and steel people out there that do not want us building on wood. Yeah. Well, especially exposed, like type three, fully exposed, type three C. I, I mean, I can tell you uh, with, the, with the first step housing project and with the Skid Row housing projects, uh, I was dealing with city of New York and Los Angeles building department, neither of which uh, wanted anything like that. And uh, it, it, it requires going to battle every day and advocating for uh, how this can be disruptive, transformative, how it can actually 
uh, change what those norms are. And I, I'll add, you know, we, we recognize that, that that's an important step, right? Educating um, and, and, and informing. And so um, the, the video series that, that we're producing, uh, one of which you saw in my presentation, the students saw a, a couple of those, I understand earlier in the week that speak to the, to the benefits of, of these materials and the opportunities. Uh, you know, those videos are meant for those, that, that, kind of, that kind of individual, you know, that has uh, the opportunity to, to take a hard look at, at some of those policies. Uh, and, and we're targeting those, influ uh, those influencers in the cities uh, specifically to, to, to bring that to their attention, that there are the, these opportunities. So I think education uh, is, a, is a key part of, of what you described. And I'm going to add, there's there's no mass timber project that is goes off smoothly without a hitch. Uh, there are there are opposing factors to it all the time. I mean, if if, if mass timber was the end all be all of everything, then everything would start being built out of mass timber. So you're going to have hurdles with uh, the general contractor. Uh, you mentioned Burn Construction that did the Soto. I have come across many general contractors that want nothing to do with mass timber because they don't know how to price it. They don't know how to build it. They just, it's what they don't know that makes them scared. And so they price it out of the ballpark so they can do concrete or steel. Uh, what we have found with even contractors that have had opposition to it is that once they do a mass timber building, they are not scared of it anymore. And they look forward to doing the next one. Uh, the other challenge you have uh, might potentially be a city. Uh, and, and, you know, you mentioned New York, New York just, recently it allowed the usage of wood in mid-rise or low and mid-rise construction under 85 feet, uh, which was a huge thing uh, with New York City because it was a long effort to get that. Um, you know, the American Wood Council is a partner organization with Woodworks. Uh, they are devoted to specifically to building departments to educate them. Um, but a lot of that sometimes will fall on uh, regional directors for Woodworks. So I've done that as well. Um, what, what I think a lot of building officials don't even realize is that this is in, Type four construction has been in the code for years. Uh, even certain mass timber systems like nail laminated timber have been in the code for years. Tongue and roof decking has been in the code for years. Uh, just because they haven't seen it built doesn't mean that they can't do it. So a lot of the times it's just simply educating them what's in the building code uh, and they should be able to uh, allow it. I've got a conversation on Friday with the building department in Frisco, Texas to talk to them about one of their first mass timber buildings. Now with a city like Rockdale, uh, you're probably not dealing with a building department that has a lot of experience with this type of construction. So it might just be simply having a conversation with them and, and letting them know, pointing to the different sections within the code and alleviating any concerns they have about building out of uh, wood. So, and, and I can certainly assist with that. So. Might, might invite you to Rockdale someday. I, I, I don't want to go to Rockdale. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I, I want to conclude this. And one reason I want to, you know, I mean, it's a great discussion going on, but one reason I want to conclude it is I want to go downstairs and look at the one put together. <laughs> and, you know, before it gets dark. And uh, so, uh, you know, so one more, you know, kind of um, uh, applause to our speakers here. Um, you know, so come on, everybody. Uh, so Aaron, Mark, and Tate. And, and I want to thank uh, Anna Beta. Uh, for doing coordination to put this all together. Uh, uh, Greg Lujan and the Department of Architecture for their support, College of Architecture uh, for their support with communications and, and computing at structure, uh, TAMU system for being here to video and get us on TV next fall. So that'll be fun. Uh, and uh, um, of course, Brand Cobb for providing material for our experiments and one unsung hero, uh, Nate, so Nate's the, the runs the kind of building proctor stuff here. And he's the one who finally just let us put it up and put it together. So, you know, so, you know, uh, he, he's, uh, he's my hero now. So, but, uh, but, but thanks guys. Uh, let's all sneak downstairs if you want to, to, to see the, uh, the work. And thanks to the students for being here.